today on the Perception and Action podcast, Perception and Action Journal Club number 25. What is the role of skill acquisition theory in coaching? Do you need a theory? If so, should you choose one or mix and match? So it's time for a call to action. Hello, and thanks for joining me. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. If you're a coach or an instructor, my goal is to help you bridge the gap between research and application, and to connect your experiential knowledge with skill acquisition and motor learning theory. I want to help take you from using practice design recipes to becoming a master chef who can manipulate the key ingredients to come up with your own innovative training methods. If you're a student or fellow academic working in the skill acquisition field, I hope to keep you up to date on the latest studies and help you get to know the people working in this area. Finally, if you're developing training technologies, I hope to help you incorporate good motor learning principles in your design, pull out key performance metrics from the data, and design effective studies to evaluate your product. To learn more, help support the podcast, and or work directly with me, please check out perceptionaction.com. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I was joined by Andrew Wilson, Marianne Davies, Stuart Armstrong, Tyler Yearby, Craig Morris, and Carl Woods for an epic discussion about some current contentious debates concerning the role of theory and coaching. Hope you enjoy. Okay, I think we're live. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Perception Action Journal Club. Uh, today is going to be an interesting one, I think. Um, what, I, what I titled it originally was Translating Research into Practice, into Coaching Practice. Um, we might do some of that. Um, you know, I had in mind talking about kind of general issues like, uh, you know, taking research articles and using them, applying studies of groups and things like that. But what I want to focus more on is the uh, more pressing thing that's becoming quite contentious, which is really, I would call it translating theory into practice, right? Um, how do you use skill acquisition theory? What's the best way to use it, if at all? Um, so that's where we want to go today. I'll, I'll say a little bit. I, before I get into that, let's, I let, want to do a quick introduction. Most of these people you've met, but there's a couple. So Tyler, can you give a little introduction? Certainly. Thank you for having me on. As always, I think I was just on a month ago, so I'm uh, happy to be back on for sure. My my goal is to speak the least today. There's a lot of bright minds on, so you'll probably hear from me the least. But uh, co-founder and co-director of education at Emergence. Happy to be on. Thank you for having me. Andrew, you're next up. On- Hello. Uh, so I'm me. Uh, so yeah, so I'm a, I'm a reader in psychology at uh, Leeds Beckett University in Leeds in the UK, and I do perception action stuff indiscriminately all over the place uh craig new new contestant <laughs> hi rob yeah thanks for having me yeah i'm craig morris i uh, coach uh canoe slalom in the uk so i work for the british team um currently based around london in the uk okay and carl in the middle yeah thanks for having me on rob um, i'm a senior research fellow in um sporting Skill Acquisition at the Institute for Health and Sport at Victoria University in Melbourne. And and Marianne, who's been on, probably get a t-shirt now. She's really, sh- there's no t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yes, um, my name is Marianne. I, uh, my background is primarily in adventure sports, but much lower level and participation and quite mixed. Um, and equestrian sports as well. And uh, I'm currently doing a PhD with um, Keith Davids looking at skill development within equestrian sports. Okay. And last but not least, Stu, live from the cabin slash sauna. <laughs> <laughs> wish, it was hot enough, wish it was hot enough to be a sauna. Um, so, uh, yeah, hi, Stuart Armstrong, host of the Talent Equation podcast and general wanger honor about all things coaching and ecological dynamics. Um, by the way, when we, when we, when we 
say things to Craig, we should say the award-winning coach, Craig Morris, by oh, the way. Nice. He's very, very humble, but recent, recently anointed. Yes, I saw that. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so to set the stage for today, a lot of this um, is related to things happening on Twitter, right? And if you want to get engaged in the discussion, that's probably the best place to be, although it's not always fun. <laughs> it's, it's engaging. But... What to frame this issue, I'm going to, and kind of generally, what there seems to be developing, and it's very contentious at the moment, kind of getting dysfunctional discussion, I would say, in some ways, is on the one hand, you have pretty much everybody in the room here um, who believes that, you know, you need to pick a theory, a theory of a skill acquisition to uh, guide your coaching. Um, And you know, outlining there's two very distinct ones, the ecological approach, ecological dynamics and information processing, which I, I tried to outline in that video that I think a lot of people have watched. So one, one side of this debate is you need to pick one of those and make a, have a consistent philosophy of coaching that fits with it. And obviously, all of us, most of us are biased towards one of those, admittedly. The other side is kind of two camps grouped together. One is a kind of, I would call it a theoretical people that don't believe that skill acquisition theory has any application to coaching, right? You don't need to take it into account at all. Um, We were talking before, you know, there's very prominent people that believe this. If you listen to the last journal club I did, Mark Williams kind of was expressing this view. You don't really need, that's kind of academic uh, issues. You don't really need those in practice. And the, the, what I'll lump into the, it depends group. Um, And by it depends, what we're talking about here is, I would call it a polytheoretical approach, right? You can pick and choose which theory you want to follow. So on one day, you might use a very isolated drill to drill a, a, a perfect, a particular technique. And then another day, you can switch to a self-organization through a constraints manipulation. So this kind of poly switching between theories. So that's what we mean by it depends. It doesn't mean you... Uh, practice is always the same for every athlete and things don't depend. It means that this kind of theory, poly theory approach. Okay. So those are kind of the two camps that seem to be arising. And it, as I say, it's getting very, very contentious, very ugly in some ways. So what I want to do today is, you know, talk a little bit about some of these issues and also focus on how we can move forward positively with this, right? Because I was saying to other people, this is an issue that's come up over and over again in ecological psychology, you hit this impasse of people and it gets quite ugly (laughs) sometimes. But so to kick things off, I wanted to pass it to Andrew because the most recent kind of activity for those, again, that aren't on Twitter happened. Andrew posted a really nice thread uh, talking about his views about kind of deciding, picking a side. (laughs) Um, And from that, there came lots of stuff. Uh, To reflect how the nature of this, I haven't seen all of it because I'm blocked by some of the people (laughs) and vice versa, I blocked them. So that's kind of the way it's been going. So it's very, um, I think it's a really important issue to address right now. So Andrew, can you kick us off? Yeah, no problem. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Good. So yeah, so I I have strong views on this for lots of reasons. And Obviously, one of the reasons is that I like the ecological approach, but fundamentally, the strong, the strongest reason is I just think it's a good way of doing things and organizing your activities. So what I did, <clears throat> so every now and again, I've been just kind of throwing out longish threads uh, about sports coaching stuff, things that I'm thinking about after chatting to people at various points. And the one that was on my mind the other day was, for various reasons, had come up this idea of it depends, right? This idea that you can pick and choose across theoretical theoretical motivations for for coaching activities and from my point of view as a research scientist that makes no sense right Um, so if I did an experiment one day that was very ecologically motivated and then the next day I ran an experiment that was very information processing uh, 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 sort of motivated I could do that but I wouldn't make any progress I wouldn't get anywhere and those two experiments wouldn't be able to talk to one another and help so instead what scientists do is you focus a little bit and so you run experiments that are coherent in their motivation so that you can build on what you've done before what other people have done before and so on and so forth so you kind of need some agreed um, terms and some agreed uh, ways of thinking about things <clears throat> um, and, and and that's kind of for me it's a really important way of making progress and so but the other oh, actually the other, the other thing that I find that's really important about it um, so a few a few years ago now, probably maybe five years ago, I was kind of just at a nice point where 
I was in between a couple of projects, just starting something new. So I was kind of in a, and I had a bit of time and space and I was just in a position to kind of set up some things for the next few years to run. And so I sat down and took the opportunity and thought about it. And I, I made a very conscious decision to just really concretely throw myself into the deep end of ecological approach to perception and action. Why? Well, first of all, because I think it's the right way to go about doing things. But second of all, I just decided to spend some time figuring out what those principles are <clears throat> and then figuring out what those what the rules are, what what the, what the legitimate moves are and what the illegitimate moves are within that theory and just see what and take it in a few directions. Um, and so that was where some papers that I did with Sabrina Galanka came out where by just kind of holding on to the ideas and instead of just going, oh, it's too hard, we're just going to abandon ship. What we did was we just kind of gave ourselves something to hold on to while the going got tough. And then we wrote some papers about some complicated things like brains and language and all those things that we get thrown at, it, uh, thrown at us very sensibly by people who want to know what stories we have. And do you know why? We, we haven't solved anything yet, but do you know what we've done? We've come up with some really good first steps and we've spent quite a lot of time articulating ways of organizing future science to actually just get a bit organized. So for me, in my, in my own personal experience, <clears throat> picking a theory wasn't about shutting my mind off to other alternatives. It wasn't about closing things off and being dogmatic. It was about choosing focus. It was about choosing a set of principles that I had various reasons to think were good ones. And then just to see how far I could push those principles in experimental work and theory work and so on. And <clears throat> what happens is what happens if you don't have that in science and philosophy and all these kinds of things is that you, you, you panic really fast because things get tough and you give up and you throw your hands up in the air. And so I, I posted a thread along these lines, but like with varying levels of effectiveness in communicating uh, these ideas because I was a bit cranky about some of the things. Um, and my pitch is that I think that coaches can and should be benefiting from this basic approach too um, for a couple of reasons. One is that, again, Picking a picking a, a framework and a set of principles, and then just deciding to, to to commit to those for a while and spend a bit of time just really investigating them, isn't being closed minded. It's not being uh, it, it, it's it's a good thing and not a bad thing. There was a lot of people. A lot of the pushback was, "Well, this seems like I'm cutting myself off from a whole bunch of stuff," and the suggestion is, well, "Yes, you are, but you're cutting yourself off from it for for a good reason." And then you're just trying to see if you can get the rest of it to work out the way you want it to. And it either will or it won't. And sometimes it won't. And sometimes you'll have to go back and do it again and try it again. And it can take some time to get these things right, especially constraints-based stuff, right? I think all, all the coaches I talk to, whenever they talk about developing a constrained game practice environment, you come up with this brilliant idea for constraining it down in terms of space or time or number of players, and you, then you stick your players into it and they self-organize themselves into something else that you had no idea, right? There's a real iterativeness built into this and the thing is if you if you panic at the first sign of trouble then you're never actually going to find out if things work or not so yeah that was the basic pitch was pick a side because it's good for you <laughs> it's a good way of framing your practice and motivating it but the second part of it is you're also taking con control of your practice right you have reasons why you're doing that thing rather than that other thing and when you have reasons for doing things, if it works, then you know more than you would have than if you had just tried something, right? A lot of the pushback I was getting was like, you know, about what's the what's that phrase? Uh, the professional uh, judgment and um, and coaching. What's that? Uh, P, yeah. So the professional the judgment decision making. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea, you know, coaches have all these instincts and they have all this knowledge and they have all this kind of uh, kind of sense of the game and they can just pick and choose. And all. First of all, where, did any, where, where does any of that come from, right? None of that's random. It comes from all the things you think and see and do and read, right? What I'm advocating for is taking a very explicit control of that so that when you do something and it does not work, you, can, you have some reasons and some ways for driving the search for how to do it better the next time. And when you find something that works, you also have reasons for knowing why it worked so that you can make it happen again on purpose as opposed to being lucky. So from me, like... This is very natural for me as a scientist, and I get and, and in science, this is how we kind of get taught how to do things a little bit. Um, and I get that it's not necessarily; it's clearly not that natural for a lot of coaches. <clears throat> 
But the pitch was simply that it has benefits in spades. And the downsides that people seem to think are there in terms of being closed-minded, in terms of all these kinds of things, just aren't there. Just They're just not. So there's a ton of plus sides, not really much in the way of downsides. There are some things in the coaching realm that get more difficult in terms of you've got some athletes, you need to actually get them to achieve some stuff. So there are limits on how much you can muck about. And I get that. That's fine. Um, but the idea is that, you know what, if you want your mucking about to be productive, you should probably have a good idea about why you're mucking about that way rather than that way. So again, I think it would help. Um, and yeah, and and just <clears throat> that's, so that's the big, that, that was kind of the big picture. Then the, the, the one last thing that came out of it was, have you done any coaching, Andrew? Is the question <laughs> I get quite a lot. Me too. Apparently, <laughs> appa- appa- apparently trying to teach my daughter to roller skate doesn't count, even though she's doing very well. <laughs> so, I, look, I get that, right? I, I understand my place in the ecosystem, but I get cranky when coaches tell me that that place is nowhere because that's not true. Um, I actually think people like myself and Rob and all the researchers that do this kind of I actually think we've got some things to tell you that you will find useful. Um, and obviously that has to be part of a conversation in which we talk to people and we find out what you actually want to know and we work together to try and bring ourselves all together, right? It's not that I have the authority. But you know what? We have a place at the table. And we can we can help and we want to help and we actually can be quite useful. Um, and I really want, kind of wanted to create space for people like me at the table so that we can actually get in there. So I guess I think that was all this kind of the, mm-hmm. that was the stuff that came out of that thread. I think that was the most interesting stuff. Yeah, no, that's the good summary. Yank. And it, does anyone want to jump in? I know, you know, I could t- maybe, you know, if we want a starting point about any, you know, the rest of besides me or coaches here, this, this, um, this common view that picking aside limits makes shrinks your toolbox, right? Does anyone want to kind of take that point on or any, any other of Andrew's? Stu, <laughs> or anything else you want to just start with, Stu? I did. I didn't think. Uh, yeah, you probably didn't think I would. I would hold back for long. No, uh, no. no. <laughs> uh, just to pick up that point, just that point there, Andrew. Around, have you actually done any coaching? Well, there's lots of us in Twitter who are coaches, you know, and I, d- I don't pretend to be a scientist. What I do like to think I'm doing is experimenting and utilizing a theoretical framework as a means of experimentation. And I do believe that that's what we all do, if I'm honest. We're always testing and learning, testing and learning continuously. Um, And um, you do in any experimental, I don't know anybody necessarily, unless there's a field of science that I don't understand or don't know of, where what you do is when you're designing an experiment, you pick a range of different theories and design an experiment based on a range of different theories. It just doesn't, I don't know if that happens, but Mm. But but anyway, imagine so I'm, you know, sometimes trying to articulate scientific theory, sometimes in a public space like a podcast or on a forum like this. Um, And I'm only you and I'm, you know, quite open about saying that I'm doing that essentially as a lay person who's trying to make sense of this stuff. And I'm trying to translate it to other lay people as well. But imagine if like one of you guys said, have you actually ever done any science? I mean, what kind of a response is that? Um, and and it's it, I mean there's something about the rudeness of it that I can't quite get to grips or get to grips with. But equally, um, I also think if I'm honest, Andrew, it's probably at, at a, that that must be a signal that you're getting somewhere with somebody because that's kind of the only response that's mm-hmm. that's, the, that's available to them. So I would kind of take it that actually maybe you're starting to get get through either that or they're just literally shutting down, in which case there's no point carrying on. Um, but I also feel, and I just I do want to just sort of circle back to this point around the closing off idea and, and all that mm. sort of stuff. I, I get that I get that to a certain extent, right? But again, it's it's this it's for me it's this idea that um, I need to explore, I need to explore, and I, and I need something to hold on to while I'm exploring. Otherwise, I'm just going to be exploring completely in the wilderness, right? I need a I need a kind of guidance tool. So my guidance tool is a theoretical framework, right? And I'm going to explore within its boundaries, and that that is deliberate. The reason being is it's still massive. There's still a load of things to explore, um, and if I didn't explore within those boundaries, I would get lost really quickly. So actually, for me, it gives me an enormous amount of guidance. And and if we're going to use 
professional judgment and decision making, PJDM, as a framework by which should guide all coach action, right? I, I'm unsure about that, but let's say we're going to use that. Well, I am using professional and judgment decision decision making within this framework. And I actually feel a little safer within this framework because at least I know something when I'm doing this process of exploration and I can learn some stuff and I can start to say, hmm, interesting. Didn't I wonder why that might not take place. Now I'll try within the framework, I'll still try something else. Now we're getting somewhere. That's interesting. Okay, I noticed that and I've got loads of examples of that. But anyway, I'll just I'll pause there. Just wanted to share a couple of little fragments with you there. Just one thing to jump in there. In science and philosophy of science, you call having a theory a guide to discovery. Mm-hmm. And without a guide to discovery, you are in the wilderness. And that's that's the point. That's the value is that it's a guide yeah, to and, discovery. And, yeah. and I would add to that, and you know, from a researcher side, I used to believe too that I wanted to just be empirical, not but you can't it's impossible. It's impossible to do an a theoretical experiment. It's like we're trying to be purely objective. We know from atoms, you can, you can't measure an atom without manipulating. It's the same thing in an experiment. I can't every from the thing I choose to measure, whether I choose to measure variability of endpoint versus the whole time series of variability. I've made a theoretical choice right there, <laughs> right? It, it, you have to have a theoretical guide to every experiment. Like you can compare theories, but you cannot do a theoretical. There's no such thing as purely empirical evidence, <laughs> I would argue. It took me a long time to learn that, but, but that's what I feel. Um, philosophy, is, philosophy of science has your back on this. <laughs> very yeah. yeah. Marianne. Yeah, I, I, I think um, what's interesting for me, actually, is that I'm hearing um, things like uh, adventure sports and the type of sports environments that are more familiar to, more familiar to me being used as um, evidence of why you have to be able to tell people stuff because they're not going to accidentally discover how to tie a proper knot or not get injured. And, um, and I, think, I think what I find maybe is important to, to consider is that one of the things the theory does, or the most important thing for me, is that it influences the way I look at what I'm doing, uh, how I notice things, the type of patterns that I see, um, the way in which I try and understand um, development in a longer term, in a nested environment. But I will still always prioritize safety and motivation. And if I do have to end up stepping in and being really quite, um, uh, you know, dictatorial about something to keep somebody safe, that doesn't mean at that moment in time, I've changed my mind about the lens in which I'm viewing that situation. It kind of just means that I, at somewhere along the line, I messed up and I've had to intervene in a way. Mm-hmm. It wasn't ideal, but it was important at that moment in time. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, and this is why I agree with An- Andrew. We still use ev- all the different tools in our toolbox, definitely. But, the, but it changed. The more I got into it, the more it changed the way I looked at what was happening in front of me. And, and some bits of it were really, really important. And I think probably for me, the most important one was that I was then trying to see what it was that needed to be developed next. What could I build on rather than what was I error correcting towards? And that dramatically, even that little thing dramatically changed the way I looked at the whole, you know, the whole environment of my coaching. But it doesn't mean that I don't blow it occasionally and have to go back to doing something that I'm I'm basically pulling back to a safe space and, and going, at this moment in time, I'm no longer developing them. I'm like yeah. retrieving a situation so that I can build it back up again. Yeah. But I'm not going to just sit back and watch somebody injure themselves or do something dumb. Yeah. And of course, there are also things that we need to share um you know, information, there's some stuff that's just actually just a simple instruction is all that's needed. And that we don't need to, to make that any more complex than it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, Can I pop in here and just kind of, yeah. sure, one, of the, one of the things that's got me very interested talking to people recently, uh, in particular to Nick Winkleman, I think he's going to be on the uh, show in a couple of weeks mm-hmm. or next week, whenever it is. Mm-hmm. <sighs> it's not the case that there is, a blanket ban on verbal instruction and the ecological approach, right? Mm-hmm. 
there's an issue of we just don't yet quite know how to talk about what we're doing when we use verbal instruction. And that's a state of the art issue, not an in principle problem. And that's another thing that came up for me. There's kind of a history to this that I've sort of explained to a couple of coaches and they've gone, oh, that's interesting. You're, like we're just kind of not there yet. But I actually think there's a ton of mileage <clears throat> and I'm thinking very actively about the art, you know, what are you doing with your very simple instruction? Sometimes it's really easy. The easiest way to implement a constraint is verbally, for example, right? And that's something I think that I'm really looking forward to. I'm really hoping people really start to engage with and start thinking about seriously. I'm pretty sure, I think I know Keith and he has PhD students, I think, who are really starting to think about this ecologically, which is awesome because it's clearly the time as well. Um, uh, but yeah, you, like we can, we can, you're not cheating by talking to your athletes. <laughs> Yeah. No, and I think, Carl, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, Marianne, I think you raise a good point there. Part of the problem I have with the the PGDM or whatever thing is it reduces the ecological approach to just a different way of designing drills. Like, it's just like the CLA. Oh, you just do it a slightly different way. But Carl, maybe... Ecological is a completely different way of looking at, and I know you've been writing about some of this, Carl, the coach relationship, how coaches develop as coaches. Can, can you talk a little bit about that, Carl, or some, anything else you <laughs> resonate yeah. with? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, 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 it's been fascinating. Uh, I guess, firstly, like I, 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 I tend to, my battleground, I guess, with these types of things is in the papers we write, okay, and, and forums like this. Um, so I tend to uh, pull back a little bit on those kind of uh, Twitter forums for the f simple fact that I don't think it helps this, these types of narratives the way that we want to help them. Um, and, and the reason I think that um, is because we just don't have enough of a capability to engage in kind of proper dialogue, or I think um, more, more scientific dialogue. Um, but... My, the biggest issue I have with a lot of what with, with I guess these um, these two approaches pitted off against each other is one of them I see as the seeing this kind of expertise coach has all the answers they're 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 the, they're the holder of all knowledge and I, I fundamentally push push back against that I, I think that's that's a really wrong way all right and I'm quite comfortable to say that's a wrong way of looking at the world. I, I actually really don't like that word expert or I, I think that's this that evokes this sense that, you know, someone is a gatekeeper to the knowledge and you need to impart that knowledge into my brain. Give me that, in, inscribe that knowledge into my brain. Help me then, then, you know, show that knowledge in the actions that I do. And that's why I, I write uh, with, with some other people really quite extensively about this symbiosis between scientists and coaches it's this, if you, if you would like to adopt this, this worldview of it, it's this empirical and experiential knowledge sources coming together or knowledge reservoirs coming together, enmeshing in this like entanglement and then pr producing this particular um, a, a preparation for performance framework. Now, um, the, there's a caveat to that and the caveat to that is that no, neither side has the answer, right? Uh, but the, the, the search space that we're going to look in is an ecological approach, and that's what binds our worldviews together. That's what kind of unlocks this really rich landscape, and, and we've written about it in a couple of papers, one on the importance of transdisciplinarity in, in, in sports science and specifically in, 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 um, in skill adaptation, uh, and, and the other on then how we co-design practice activities to get the best out of, uh, out of both worlds, and I think that's this that, that bodes to this notion that me as a scientist or as a practitioner, I'm, I, I've kind of been in both these days, I probably see myself more as a scientist, um, is that I, I don't have the answers. Um, let's, but, but that's, that's part of the fun. Let's go and look together. Let's, let's go and explore these landscapes together. Let's, in, let's invite an athlete in. Let's talk to them. What are you seeing? What are you feeling? What, what don't you like? What do you like? What makes you feel uncomfortable? Um, yep, you've, you've got the keys to this particular training activity. Redesign features as you're going um, what, as to what you're feeling, as to what your teammates are feeling. Um, um, it's not a free-for-all because it's still, though, guided by a, an, an ecological approach, um, which the other area which we'll probably get to, which grinds my gears a little bit in this area, is I feel like we're, we're fighting a battle on different levels. Um, I think 
the battle from a, an information processing approach is methodological and the battle we're coming from is perhaps ontological or a worldview, which is why they're not compatible, which is why people are going, hang on a second, you're telling me I can't tell my players what to do. Um, that, that's just nonsensical. Yeah, it is nonsensical, exactly like what Marianne said. There is a time and place for, for perhaps guiding, there's a time and place for nudging, and there's a time and place for showing. Um, uh, but the point of all these things is more at, at the root of the tree. And one of them, when you're, when you're telling, it's an inscription. It's a, this is the way. The other way in telling is perhaps to guide attention, is to invite someone into a world to allow them to go and explore it on, on, on their own. So you can have the same methodology, but they're coming from different worldviews. And I think that's what gets fundamentally missed in this space, um, which, which is, is pushing us into a direction these days of writing about knowledge and what knowledge is. And I think this is where we have these two camps, is that one of them views knowledge as an inscriptable, um, transmittable thing, the other one views knowledge as, as a real perception and action uh, in, in, in some particular context. It's not something I can inscribe in anyone's mind. It's just something I can guide. It's just something I can nudge. And it's something that I, I can be guided and nudged in through interactions with that particular organism, with that particular uh, athlete. So, um, yeah, there's a bit to un uh, unpack in that. But I, I guess my, my, my fundamental bugbear is I actually think we're, we're arguing at different layers. Um, which which creates a lot of confusion, um, and and we just as a result of that, people tend to not be able to see how the worldviews aren't compatible because all of these approaches, all, all of these methodologies that are apparently off limits in an ecological approach, are absolutely on. They're absolutely on the table. Yeah. How we interpret them and how we use them is just coming from a different tree. You know, it's coming from the roots of a different tree. Um, but we're, we're, we're too preoccupied at kind of pointing out branches of the tree instead of actually attacking the roots of the problem, which is, I think, how we take up with the world. Um, so, uh, yeah, throw, throw yeah. that out to anyone and see what sticks. That's a great point. Amen, amen to all of that. That was, very, <laughs> that was really well put, really clear. Yeah. yeah. That was, I agree entirely. Yeah. No, I agree with that, Carl. And that's the point I've been trying to make. Like, even like variability, variability supports both information and equal it's just how you but it guides how you use it when you use it why you use it so it gives you principles um craig can i jump on your your kind of thoughts yeah, on sure, this yeah this? i just, think i'm um i think i'm living in carl's middle ground at the moment <laughs> um definitely in the as dave snow wouldn't put it entangled in the brambles um, <laughs> between empirical and experiential um yeah, I feel like a bit of a guinea pig here. I'm definitely as far away from a scientist as you're going to get on this call, I think. But, um, I'll maybe touch on my journey a little bit because it might resonate and then we can mm. pick, pick some holes and challenges in that, Rob, if that's okay. That sounds um, great. I'll try and, be con try and be concise. So I was, I've was i been on paper coaching 15 years. I actually think I've been coaching about three years of that, the most recent three. Um, but I was never coached as a paddler myself, didn't have a stable access to a coach. And I think that's been a massively influential factor in in my emergent learning journey. I think I've ha I've ha I've not really been exposed like I had no I didn't know what pedagogy meant until about 2 years ago. Um that was probably someone on Twitter someone's fault on Twitter that steered me down that line but I come from a journey where I was just quite ontological. I wanted to be a good decent human being. I saw myself as no more no better than anyone else, no worse than anyone else, quite equal. I've got quite quite sort of Buddhist underpinnings. And my coaching early on was just about, okay, I want to be a good person. I want to give agency to others on an equal playing field. And I can currently access that niceness through the vehicle of canoe slalom and pay a few bills while I decide what to do with my further education. And I think um, going through that path, like trying to be a nice person only got me so far because we're dealing in a sport as well, right? <laughs> um, and I had this artistic view of the sport that was inherited from my brother. I had no other underpinnings as to, as to what canoe slalom was. And I think my, my movement in terms of my own practice was one of just trial and error, but predominantly frustration, um, frustration in the moment. And I touch on one highlight when I had uh, a young female who, female who I was working with at quite a high level age group championship turn around to me and said, ah, oh, yeah, when I maneuvered around that gate halfway through my final run, I thought, Craig's going to hate the way I position my stroke, you know, in very, very internal cue terms. 
position my stroke in that particular moment. And it, it, I'll be honest, in the moment, I was like, yeah, I did. I did hate that. Um, but only in like the subsequent months and years did I reflect on that and kind of think, what is that saying about my coaching? We're in a sport here that is, is A to B, no time penalties, fastest top to bottom. We're not scored on aesthetics or anything. There's no one way. And there's all sorts of body types. You know, we've had 90 kilo Olympic champions in the men's car. We've had people down at 60. Anything goes. Um, and I wondered what it was saying about my practice, that their attention to the information variables in the moment, given that there are tons in airsport, as there are in most, was attuned to my feedback or a comparative lens to what the coach would be viewing of the situation. So it definitely wasn't in the here and now and definitely wasn't specifying for the performance. And it was kind of frustrations through that lens that really led me to explore, like, so what's going on here? Um, and the, the route I came to a more ecological view, I think, of coaching, or just to understand what coaching is, was in working my way through, through those narratives, through, through those problems, and somebody actually encouraging me to ask what my sport was, to actually understand backwards from the sport. Because I didn't know anything about coaching, didn't know anything about science, didn't know anything about learning but I knew about my sport or I thought it did, but I'd never ask what is the actual in-race demands of the sport on an individual interacting in that environment. And as soon as I did that, I think it was like a light bulb went off. And of course, then you reflect on your practice and go, well, are you preparing them for that? You're absolutely not in hindsight. And, and then I went on a journey and, mm -hmm. and it's, I guess, currently putting me in rooms like this <laughs> <That's great. laughs> and people like Andrew Wilson contributing to an ever growing reading list on a daily basis. Um, you yep. need to release an audio book version. I think Andrew, that's <laughs> making, making your head spin. Um, maybe Tyler, maybe we can go to you. Um, obviously you, um, you, you would develop, a, you and other people, Sean have developed a whole company that is kind of addressing this this issue, right? This theory, research, practice gap. So kind of what are your thoughts on on some of these issues and, and anywhere you want to take it? <laughs> no, I appreciate the question. Yeah. And yeah. I'll, I'll certainly get to the emergence piece here in a second. But yeah. I can tell you that my own struggle is really and truly what led me down this path towards seeking other ways to approach how I could be uh, helpful uh, along an athlete's journey. And obviously, there are two main theories to motor learning, but I really view it almost as three. You, you have the information processing view, you, you have the ecological view, and then you have the it depends, I'll kind of choose what I want to choose whenever I want. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, the, the latter is the most detrimental to the athletes. And the athletes is who we want to help the most. And so while I disagree with a one-size-fits-all, you know, perfect model type approach where it's stored as knowledge somewhere in the brain, I'd rather almost that than someone that knows there's a difference between the two and just does both. Because if we truly want to help our athletes, just picking and choosing and kind of pulling and tugging on both sides can be, can be very harmful and quite insidious, quite frankly. So for me, I, I found the ecological approach to be very freeing. Um, oftentimes people think that it almost limits your ability to do certain things, but um, like we've discussed oftentimes before, is it's almost those these um, constraints provide opportunities for us and other ways to go about doing things, even as a coach. And so much in the same way Carl was talking about just a second ago, the, the co-design piece or even the representative co-design piece, I have learned more about my own sport and kind of piggyback on what Craig was talking about within his particular sport. In American football, I've learned more about American football when I started asking athletes questions you know, about what their interactions were, what their experience was like. And then if we talk about how we can then step into the learning space, if we you know we want them to, to do a certain thing maybe, versus being very, very explicit with that, I can lead them through questioning. You know, Carl and colleagues have done a great job with that. I wrote a recent blog post on it, essentially helping to guide their search. We can manipulate constraints. And then kind of what uh, Andrew was talking about earlier was on purpose, not by accident. And for me, when I was in my early stages of using a CLA, I made a lot of mistakes and I was just kind of randomly manipulating things. But what that did for me as a coach is it allowed for me to gain an understanding as to why they may be doing certain things. And then through conversation, it allowed for me to gain a better understanding through analysis of their movement, what they might be connecting to. And so, you know, with the creation of emergence, you asked about that. This, these, these separate camps is actually one of the main reasons why we did. 
we created the company because while I'm on my very early stages of my research career, I've been a practitioner for roughly 15 years as well, kind of stumbling my way as I've you know gone about that path. But what I found is there are so many practitioners out there that are aware of different theories of motor learning. They choose to ignore them because they want to push their particular movement or their particular model for that athlete and then for maybe all the athletes in the same way. And I stand back and I watch it now, and it's it's what's so disheartening to me because with this day and age of our social media platforms, coaches will see certain things because it may look pretty or it was filmed very nicely with a good camera. I want to do that because I can tag that particular person. And that that there, you know, for me is where the rub lies and why I get so passionate about it because I still make plenty of mistakes. I don't have it all figured out, but I can tell you going back to the freeing piece of an ecological approach for me to be able to co-manipulate constraints that may come in the form of space. It may come in the form of the amount of opponents on the field, you know, what the opposition may be doing is done through watching film. It's done through watching practice, you know, from different angles and different positions to see what the athlete may be picking up, what they might be rejecting. And then having conversations about the interactions, not so much as so that they will respond to me, but yet just getting a little bit more clarity because I see their actions. And that's the response that I really am looking for is what their actions are, because that tells me what they are picking up and accepting is that particular invitation for action. So those are kind of some of my my thoughts as I listen to the, all the other bright individuals. And one of the thing I, I did want to mention, and obviously I agree with a vast majority of what Andrew was sharing. The part about the verbal communication, the verbal instruction, I agree with that. I, I agree with that. But one thing we have to keep in mind is that we're not assigning a particular action with that verbal instruction. And I'm not saying you were saying that by any means, Andrew, but there are other individuals that will assign these uh, these these cues or certain things to people. And it's almost prescriptive instruction. So I do want coaches out there to know that that's something that can also be detrimental in their learning process. Um, so how we say what we say is certainly going to impact the way that they go about interacting with the world around them. I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, because it's a thing, been a thing on my mind. And mm -hmm. you know, here's a pitch for how science and theory can help, right? So in the theoretical work that Sabrina and I have done, we're one of, one of the big things we've been trying to do is develop coherent ecological vocabularies for talking about some of these complicated problems, right? And one of the things that um, Sabrina's really led on, actually, uh, that I think has just has turned into very useful sorts of things, and it relates very particularly to speech, is <clears throat> we we draw this distinction between uh, the the, the law-based use of information and the convention-based use of information. The law-based use of information is you couple to some form of time to contact information in order to dodge the thing, right? You're, you're, you're using the information as information for the thing that created it by law. Um, but you can also do convention based, right? I can tell you pick up the red cup versus pick up the blue cup. Now, the limit of convention based use information is it cannot, cannot possibly guide movement execution. It can only guide movement selection. I can make you go that way or that way but the actual kinematics of the reach can only be controlled by the law-based use of information about the object that I'm currently interacting with, okay? So it's fun. I'm, It's really interesting that you brought that point out because as I'm thinking about trying to how to engage with this problem and taking the tools that I've got and throwing them at them and see what happens, that's one of the first things that comes out. You can use speech. The way we use speech is convention-based, and so you can use speech to constrain action, but you can't use it to guide movement execution. And that's why, like, and, and and one of the things I would hope is that the kind of the theory work that we've done trying to develop these ideas can provide a, a rationale for that claim, which is quite, as you noted, is really important. So again, there's like, there's a, the, the, I hope there's a place for right. to develop the technical vocabularies and do our job, but also it's great to know that that's also a, question you wanted an answer to which is right no and that's why i think this has a massive place within the field and the constraining the action piece that's another that's another point that you raised that i think is something that we need to be aware of because if it can constrain particular actions then you know we need to be careful that we're not assigning them by by limiting what they could be doing because that might be us imparting our knowledge on them and i'm not to say by any means that coaches don't have a place but 
you know, we want to see what their actions look like based on the information that they are picking up and they're connecting to. And so that's where, you know, from a, from a coach's standpoint or a practitioner standpoint, something that we are learning more about. And I know the community really, really wants to learn more about simply because there are a lot out there right now that are doing more harm than I think they are good, even though they mean good. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's exciting to hear though, for sure. Yeah. yeah, and it's 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 a really fascinating question. You're absolutely right. I'm really interested. I'm glad that it's not just me that spotted that that it's actually coming out as well because I think it's, I think it's really fascinating. And I but I, but you know what it is? That's my toehold into an ecological way of thinking about something that apparently there is no ecological way of thinking. Right. So that's the that's the again just to pitch the value of holding on to those principles and not letting those go. You know, you you hold on while the going gets tough and people think you can't do it, and you just keep trying. <laughs> you just say no. I can. I can do this, and you. You know. And I, as a scientist, as a researcher, as a person who does theory stuff, trying to figure these things out, I find it personally very useful to have a reason not to give up immediately when it gets tricky, because it gets tricky a lot. Yeah. yeah. yeah there was a there was a point that one of you uh, brought up um, about uh, the, the the coach having a place. Um, I just wanted to, to touch on that quickly because it's a, it's a, fr a real frustration of mine that gets kind of pushed back. Um, I say out, but in our, our collective faces, um, that, uh, an ecological approach pushes that there's, there's no room for a coach. Oh, well, what you just let the, 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 the athlete or the individual self-organize, they go and do it. So if these things just emerge. And I think Marianne, you mentioned it about not tying and well, what it's just spontaneously supposed to happen. <laughs> and I've been I've been really uh, pondering that for for a while now. And I think one of the the issues that it falls back to is these is this etymological connotation of education, right? And I think the we, we we've confused it etymologically. Education is educere, which means lead out, right? And, and there's this other version of it, which is educere, which is teach. And I think we we focus too much on teach. Whereas in an ecological approach, what we're actually doing is, is, we're, is we're helping the lead the athlete out. And what, what, what I mean by leading out is actually providing conditions where we're helping set up conditions for which they can navigate these action spaces, right? So it's not just a matter of throwing a bit of rope on the ground and going, right, uh, I'll see you in six months after you've kind of figured out how to tie that knot yourself. No, it, it's providing um, or it's guiding their, their, their attention along the way. Now, through that observation of, of, of seeing how they interact with that space, we might accentuate features, we might dampen features. Um, the, the, the tools, are, are, again, I hate using that, that word tool because it, it still feels a little, it's not intended to be, but it still feels a little mechanistic. But anyway, like we, we, we have these things available to us as, as practitioners, which we can help um, guide that, that, that particular process for them or that, that, that particular search. Um, uh, for them, but it, it's not this. It, it, it's just a fundamental. I think it's a pretty lazy interpretation, if I'm being honest. That you know, practitioners, there's no, there's no space for them. It's just, it's just wrong. It, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a fundamental misinterpretation of what an ecological approach is, which is to lead someone out into an environment to guide their attention, such that they can listen, they can look, they can smell, they can taste, they can interact with things to discover things for themselves under some particular supportive guidance, under, under some particular um, notion. And this, this is why um, late last year, earlier this year, uh, we published a paper um, referring to it as like sports ecology designers because I actually view um, uh, practitioners in the same way as my, my, my partner, Chloe. Her, her father is an organic farmer. And it's the, I, 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 the, 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 the discussions I have with, with him are far more interesting i think than than um engaging in the in in uh, debates with people that don't want to engage and and the reason is he sets up conditions for which plants animals they they, they grow he doesn't grow them and, and I, I look at that lens as is i'd look at that through the exact same lens as what we're trying to do in an ecological approach i'm my job's not to 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 um um make an athlete that does these things in a really robotic and, and pre-programmed way. My, my job is to help create a, an environment 
um, that, that, that um, sees them discover these things for themselves. And, and what they discover might be what I've already discovered, which is sweet. What they discover might be something I haven't already discovered, which is why then co-design such an integral part. But, but again, I think how we, we coach in, in an ecological approach, I, I view it in the same way as how we set up organic farming, um, that, w- that we have to set up um, really conducive conditions. And if we don't set those conditions up well, plants die. And instead of using a pesticide to kill the, the thing that's killing the plant, which I think is like, oh, it's too hard, I'm going to throw my hands up in the air, we actually have to go back and go, right, what happened there? Oh, I didn't get the soil quite right. Okay, I need to need to manipulate this particular feature or, you know, to adopt the phrase, we need to manipulate this particular constraint to then create a more conducive environment to allow that particular uh, organism to grow. Um, but, yeah, I, I wanted to, 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 to pick that thread up because it is a, it's a real frustration of mine. When I see people um, lazily accuse coaching of having no place in an ecological approach, is is uh, is a fundamental misinterpretation of a worldview of what an ecological approach is, which is to lead out, which is to to to, to help create conditions, which help the athlete grow. I'm not doing anything other than providing opportunities for them to interact with. I'll I'll run with that, Carl. You provoke some thought in me. I'm pretty laid back, but one thing that does grate me is is this sense of coaching for redundancy. I've got no passion to try and achieve that whatsoever. I quite enjoy what I do. Um, and <laughs> I, I hope it's not really a, like inspiring me to go and research to improve that much that I will never have the desire to improve <laughs> anymore. Um, but I think, I wonder if, I think language is a really critical thing in a lot of this debate. And I'm sure Nick Winkleman will talk more, more, mm. more um, with more insight than I can on that. But I wonder as coaches, if we're guilty of, of maybe consciously or subconsciously creating a knowledge differential with with the athletes, with the players, with the the participants, whoever it might be in our own worlds. And I wonder what our motivation is to do that at times, whether it's to satisfy our own needs of or a, a need for security within a particular organization. Like I know I've become more bold and creative as I've become less and less fearful about losing my position. Um, knowing that I have a future and I don't feel like I need to prove myself to anyone. Um, but I think one point from a personal level, and I only speak for myself, is that, and it maybe advocates taking a position um, from, from Andrew's point at the, at the start, is that when I communicated my why I coach the way I coach to my athletes about three, three years ago, it fundamentally changed their relationships for the better, mm-hmm. massively, like literally instantly within practice. Um, and I communicated it not from a position of knowledge, just here's what I'm coming to understand and where I'm currently at. Principles over rules. Throw it out there. How does it land with your map of the world, your experience of the sport, um, and challenge it? You know, mm-hmm. and how do you want me? To, how do you want to learn based on what I've told you? And, and do you want to challenge that position? And generally, it was met with with intrigue. Um, and certainly one of the athletes I do coach has probably taken a journey from a much more instructional repetition um, in isolation-based approach with an sport. It's hard to do in air sport because <laughs> it's quite fluid anyway, but has gone on a journey with me. And I think to, to Carl's point, like, I think we're un- creating an understanding together, mm-hmm. co-learning <laughs> together. And that's been way more fascinating. Like, I'm really clear on how much I don't know. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot out there that I don't know that I don't know. Um but communicating the why with an intentional point of reference was key. I think like coaches are very, very ready to ensure that their athletes have a focus to the session, a goal, an intention. Um, you know, we, it's, I'm clear that I need to understand their intention before I can even begin to try and sit in their situation and understand what they're attending to. And I think why wouldn't we ask that of ourselves as a coach? Mm-hmm. You know, and the framework, the ecological framework for me shapes my intentions and gives me a reference point of an anchor so today i was i was really stuck today uh, <laughs> and really close to to giving answers um <laughs> and like marianne like i you know i fall into direct instruction and i say fall because generally my reflection is that it's because i haven't been as skillful as i would have wanted to have been uh, and i reflect on that in action and then i grate myself on action later um and i normally find a better way or ask for feedback from the athlete um, to be challenged around that space. But it gives me a point of reference, and then I get to speak to some wonderful people as well and people at the other end of a continuum 
Uh, I know EKD and IP isn't a continuum, but certainly <laughs> I think a lot of things do sit on a continuum of practice in context. Um, I would put, I think Tyler touched on it, like there's a real fine line, I think, between verbal constraint and direct instruction. Um, if if the verbal constraint is getting toward directing action or certainly very much narrowing the shirt space. So that's where we like to talk. But then I have a continuum that I can be conscious of, as Stuart alerted me to a few months ago. Like I'm definitely just more conscious of what I'm doing and I've got a reference point to reflect upon. Uh, no, that's really, that's really interesting, Craig. I, I like that, uh, you know, that view and, um, you know, thinking of, and both, I got, we got a comment, a uh, skill germination is the, the new term. <laughs> uh, Stu, I wanted to, to address, spin this off. So part of the challenge of getting the ecological message across and Andrew and Stu, uh, you both are, is the traditional information processing approach is so ingrained in the way people think <coughs> that you almost have to get like hyperbolic, not hyperbolic is probably not the right, yeah. but aggressive about ki kicking people's minds. And you, you know, it's like Stu dr ditch the drills, right? You, you have to be kind of upfront about it. And from that, you know, there's been, you, we've been accused, you people have been accused of being bullshitting and not evidence-based and, so I want to give you a chance to talk about that, Stu. You know, you know how do we what we have to do to try to get this message across and some of those kind of accusations. Um, I'm I'm glad you gave me the opportunity because <laughs> I've been brooding on it a while. I know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's difficult. It, it's difficult to know where to start. I mean, one of the the things I think you're right. I think you're right, and and I, I've been reflecting on that a little bit because, as Andrew pointed out, you know, I um. I felt a little bit like, um, you know, uh, it was Gavrilo Princip, wasn't it? it? Was the guy who kind of like killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand and it started World War One. I. I felt a little <laughs> bit like that, right? Because you know, I made reference to a particular like thing on Twitter, and all of a sudden, Jesus, like a whole weekend's worth of kind of back and <laughs> forth, and you know, and, and and there was a lot of people uh, in that, you know, kind of saying, "Come on, you know, stop it, just." get over it. You know, this isn't helping anyone. It's switching me off, da, 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 you know, and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, yeah, I, I mean, I can understand all of that. And I was walking the dog on Monday morning and I was I, like recorded a bit of a re reflective piece that I've not, I've not published yet. And I'm still thinking about whether to or not, but about like, why, why does it go like that? And I, and I, you know, taking an element of responsibility about this, I mean, you know, that was a that was me being a bit deliberately provocative. And the reason I was being deliberately provocative was because I was being provoked. Behind the scenes, I've got people kind of rubbing my nose in stuff, going, oh, you look, you see, and this, that, and the other. So there was a part of me that was saying, well, hang on a second. If your perspective around the idea of it depends and the idea of there's an array of possibilities and we shouldn't be too constrained by particular perspectives – and it is down to professional judgment, decision making, and these sorts of things. Well, here's an example of where that goes wrong, or an example at least where things happen that are really quite negative, which suggests to me then that we should ask ourselves some questions about the value of that particular approach. Whether I associate it with PJDM or not, I don't know. But and and I and, and my question, I suppose, often is is that and and there. Are, in my mind, and this is where I come to this from, I'm looking at this partly from a policy perspective, but also partly from a practice perspective. And I, I see that we have two, probably more than two, but I can think of two crises at the moment in the world of sport and physical activity. And the one crisis is, is sport is, in my opinion, we're seeing signs anyway, very strong signs, that sport is becoming increasingly irrelevant for children. Mm. Um, and, and we're seeing quite rapid dropouts we're seeing um you know higher levels of obesity higher levels of inactivity as young people and there's a lot of factors to this of course right but as young people switch essentially from a physical dimension to a virtual dimension and my biggest passion in life is to say what's the best way we can possibly create the physical dimension at least as compelling as the virtual dimension and one of the things i see in my children is they have a lovely they have lovely freedom there they have an opportunity to interact with their peers. There's no one telling them what to do. They can scream and shout, make up their own rules, create lots of different spaces. Yes, it's defined. Yes, no one's going to get 
fall, you know, no one's going to fall off a bridge or run in front of a car. It's perfectly safe space, and and they can spend hours and hours of absorption in that in that world, and are, are actually being really quite creative whilst doing so. Right, so they're going there because there's obviously something appeal, appeal, appealing, and we've got a, a world of sport that is sometimes the very opposite of that. No, no, you must do this. Why? Because it's good for you. Why? Because I say so. Why? Because of my professional judgment. Okay. <laughs> And then, and then there's another dimension, which I was alluding to in this particular piece of research, which is we're seeing a, gr- a second crisis, which is in abu- athlete abuse and athlete welfare. Mm-hmm. Now, again, I'm not saying that it depends and PJDM is responsible for athlete welfare problems, but there are sports at the moment with fairly widespread cases of, of ritual, essentially ritual cultural humiliation and physical abuse baked into the DNA of the activity. Right. And no one's challenging that. And I'm pretty certain that a vast majority of people in that space are either saying one of three things. Well, I was doing what I thought was right. Right. I was doing what I thought they needed, not what they wanted, but what they needed. Or this is what everybody else was doing. None of those things are acceptable. Now, in that context, and that, if I'm honest, is the lens through which I'm looking at a lot of this stuff. Right. And having that lens makes me a bit of a prick sometimes. (laughs) Right. Okay, and there's times when I probably reflect and think, oh, why am I doing that? And there's another part of me thinking, actually, this is an important conversation to have. Now, it descends sometimes, and it's the medium of Twitter, sadly, Mm -hmm. that sometimes makes things very adversarial and very confrontational. But I have to say, I'm often very surprised at how quickly it descends to that. Mm -hmm. It descends to essentially, I mean, because Twitter's essentially a town hall, right? Or, yeah, you know, a town square where people, but it descends into pointing fingers really quickly. And it's and and there's a part of me that wonders why that's the case. Why does that happen? Why do people get into that space? Why can't we just have a good faith dialogue? And I find myself drawing into that, doing a bit of point scoring here and there, and this, that, and the other, and probably oughtn't to, and all those sorts of things. I've got to do better as far as that's concerned. But the the fundamental thing for me is, and and this is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the ecological approach, is because, and it's like everybody here, yes, it maps onto a worldview. But there is a fundamental, and this is going back to Carl's point about the kind of, the, it's a way of looking at the world, right? And you can either look at the world that basically says, right, um, the locus of control is with me. It's about my professional judgment, right? And as long as I can rationalize it, it then I've got, there's a reason to do this and that's good, right? And I guess a lot of PGDM research, as far as I understand it, right, I'm probably going to misinterpret it now, but, but a lot of PGDM research is from things like, you know, medicine and from like emergency services and places like that. Well, you've got to make decisions on the fly, right? And the decisions are probably like, are 10 people going to die or are five people going to die? Which way are you going to go, right? Or, or whatever, you know, it's that quick. And you don't notice what the outcome is going to be, right? So you've got to call. And I get all that. And coaching can be a bit like that, right? And I understand all that stuff. But there's a fundamental problem with PGDM for me. It's the P bit. You've got to be a professional. <laughs> You've got to have extended period of study by the definition. Well, how many people have got that? I'm not going to even say I have. We're all on a learning journey, right? So I look at the ecological approach because it actually gives me a lot of guardrails. It says to me, actually, well, the central point here really isn't about me. It's about them. And if it's going to, the starting point is going to be about them, well, they're going to tell me if it's going to go wrong. And I'm going to hold back instead of me saying, no, 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 there's a thing that has to happen. And you're just a passive passenger on the route to that while I get you there. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess that's, I don't know, it's a little framing I wanted to put in place because I've been thinking about it a lot for the last couple of days. Yeah. No, no, I think that's it. Um, t- Tyler, you you can I, you you have to drop out in a little bit. So I thought I would turn to you. Um, any thoughts about this kind of... Um, no, so along with that, the other issue I wanted to address, and I think, you know, emergence is really focused on this particular issue is the terminology issue, mm-hmm. the penetrability of the, and I know you, that's a big motivation for emergence and what you try to do. So, you know, any of those kind of issues, I'll, I'll just le- let you talk. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting because I find it to be lazy, quite frankly. I mean, I try to figure out a different way to say it that doesn't come across harsh, but I feel like that anything that's worth knowing is going to have some language that's involved in it. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was having a conversation with an athlete of mine the other day, and she's wanting to go into engineering. She's a senior, plays softball. She's wanting to go into engineering. She's looking at Purdue, Minnesota, a couple of other schools in the Big Ten. And she made a comment that the thing that was the most challenging was understanding the language. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, what about that is something that makes you nervous or you're excited about? Tell me more. 
And she said, well, I know that I need to because I'm going to be successful in the field. I need to understand the terminology. And I just I, I heard that. And obviously, I'm happy for her. But then I think about where we are in this place. And I feel like that oftentimes coaches just want the easy way out. They want they want the keys to whatever they need to do exactly. And they want to just plug them in. And once again, here we are circling back to that might be harmful for the athletes. And uh, to Stuart's point, that actually might be harmful to just them learning in general and their lifelong endeavor of of movement and their their joy and fun of movement. Um, so kind of circling and tying the two together, the terminology piece, I feel like that that coaches um, and researchers clearly have a, a good grasp on the ideas, but coaches, practitioners out there need to at least have a, a fundamental understanding um, of what the words mean, because not only does it allow us to convey uh, messages you know, across the field where we can actually learn more and help more people, but yet we can also direct their search more so because it allows for us to understand how powerful the words are and what they mean. And sometimes I get coaches to ask, as like, I ask myself, like, do you use these words with your athletes? Not nearly as much as I do with mm -hmm. practitioners that are, you know, understanding of them or researchers. But yes, I do find myself, you know, saying words like attunement or workspace or, you know, calibrate or different things. Oddly enough, they actually will respond back to me with certain things with their actions and with their words that convey that they actually understand what it means. And I don't need them to tell me that they know what it means, but they have a, a rich knowledge of the situations and the sports that they play. And so when I say the words such as attunement, or I say the words such as we want to get you to a place where you have ownership and maybe a little bit of uh, self-regulation, active self-regulation, they, they're like, no, no, that makes sense because I, I'm, I'm going to be out of the pitch by myself or I'm going to be on the court by myself. Like they get it. So I just feel it's quite lazy, honestly. And um, in our, our main course at Emergence Underpinnings, we include a movement terminology cheat sheet. Uh, we include it in there because we want coaches just to slowly start letting it marinate and understanding what these ideas mean. And so I do think it's important. I think it's important to understand. And then the last point I'll make about that, and, and I'll get off of this soapbox, with coaches that actually have an issue with it, I hear them saying, I can't believe you guys use the word attractors. You use, you know, calibration and attunement and this, that, and the other. And then you'll hear them start to talk about, I need you at this degree whenever you're coming out of this movement or, you know, this particular energy system. And as it breaks down in your, in your body, and I'm like, do you even hear what you're saying? Like you're telling <laughs> us we don't need to say this, but yet you're saying the same thing in a, in a completely different way. But yet it's very dogmatic. It's indoctrinated in them to think that way. So I think it's lazy. And I think that coaches need to come onto it slowly, much in the same way as myself. Like, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, Okay, stable state of organization, things emerge, self-organization, you know, like even within our field, people have a, you know, very, very well-known practitioners struggle to understand what self-organization means. Mm -hmm. uh, they think it just means randomly, you know, coming about and figuring it out. And so I think that there's time that needs to be spent in the area, number one. And then back to my last point, and I'll turn it over. The, the point that Stu was making as far as like just athlete wellness, and it is more than sport. And I'm finding that even though I primarily uh, enjoy working with advanced, let's call it advanced level movers, you know, within the sport of American football, I have a growing passion for youth now. And it's because I work in a facility where I work with youth on a regular basis. And I am getting a chance to see the power of co-design even with youth, you know, maybe having a crash mat that's there and they're catching a ball. I'm not telling them how to now catch that ball, but that crash mat affords them a different way to catch it. And then letting them make their own rules within that particular game. And what I really want to promote and what we want to promote through Emergence, we actually have a course coming out called Origins that's specifically designed because of this is promoting lifelong joy in movement. And if we do that, the, the ability for them to then potentially be very good at their sports, high school level, collegiate level and beyond, in my opinion, is going to is going to just increase. So I think that coaches need to have at least a little bit of an understanding of movement terminology, uh, specifically as it exists within an ecological approach or an information processing, whatever approach it is, whatever uh, guiding theory that you use. I think that it's um, important for coaches to understand. Um, and then secondarily, I do think that we need to look at athlete wellness. And I think we need to look at it uh, from the youth level and across the um, timescales of learning. No, amen, Tyler, about the, the, the terminology. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> I feel the, the same way. Um, anyone else? A Andrew, maybe you, you, you're you different side than Stuart, but you have 
have a history <laughs> of being aggressive about uh, yeah. about ecological so, in your blog have, and everything else. So I have yeah. had many thoughts. I'm sorry, I've just been <laughs> jotting things down as Stuart and Tyler have been talking. Um, Stuart, hundred percent agree. Tyler, love it. all all the things you were just saying. It's fantastic. Like yes, you can't. You have to coaches. You have to meet us part way. Right. I'll I'll help you learn what an affordance is, but for the love of God, if you're gonna like talk about like that's it's a word and that's the, the <laughs> thing and it's you know and it's funny like part of the part of the papers the theory papers that Sabrina and I work on are like I was saying they're about developing ecological vocabularies for framing and discussing certain issues and if you can't do that then you're not going to get your thing on right so yeah hundred percent but um, right a million thoughts I have been very feisty for a long time. One of those, so, but it's funny, I have, as I've gotten older, I've, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on that. So, you know, like Stuart's point, right? Why are we, why, why do we get so feisty about this thing? Well, because we think it's important and we value it and we think it matters and we think it has consequences for things that we give a damn about. That's why we're a bit feisty about it. And that's why I, be, I, I do get a bit cranky at the tone policing because the tone policing tends to come from the, People who feel like they're in charge doesn't come from, you know, it's very much, well, you know, uh, they're allowed to be firm. We're not because we're just being naughty or we're being provocative. But you were just you were just very clear about something that you just said. So there's an awful lot of that. That issue of tone policing is a, is a thing. And I'm, I'm old enough and cranky enough that I will simply push through tone policing if I think it's wrong. However, I don't want to be I, I, like I, I don't want to be a dick. Right, <laughs> so I do pay attention and listen when things go. And I've I've thought a lot over the years, and had a lot of conversations about. I want to be an effective communicator. That's fundamentally my goal: is to be an effective communicator and educator of these ideas. And so, communication, successful communication, is my main goal. Sometimes that means being clear and 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 firm and not brooking certain arguments as no we're not going to relitigate that we've we've dealt with that we've moved on we're going to we're just going to ignore that right now you don't get to bring that up that gets interpreted by some people as being very grumpy and cranky and it's you know you, you're going to have to work with me i'm sorry on that one but also part of the reasons you know i've been throwing these threads up on twitter and i write stuff on the blog the blog tagline is it's a space for us to think out loud about theories until we've got some and I think about that a lot. Like I haven't changed that since we did it because it's that's what it is. It's a place for me to think out loud, and I can't. I can't do. So. I need. I need forums like this, right? These con conversations with the people. I learn things in conversations as I try and, and and make my communication more and more effective. So I'll try and say something and see if it works and see if, see if it resonates. See if it doesn't work, right? Am I am I being? These things are like are very important to me in terms of making sure that um, I don't create obstacles to communicating to people. That said, one of the lessons I have learned over the years as an academic and as a person who has engaged in a lot of arguments about these things in various formats is I'm not going to convince the old people. I'm not going to convince people who have spent 20 years committed to an information processing approach to suddenly become ecological psychologists. Why? For exactly the same reason they can't convince me, sunk cost. We've been doing this too long, right? It's hard work to change. I don't blame them, right? So what I've realized is that I can have conversations with those people. And one of the things I like about Twitter and one of the things I find it really nice, this is why I miss conferences because whenever I go to conferences, you know, they're like EWEP or ECPA or any of these ecological conferences, I always meet up with a bunch of grad students who were like, look, I didn't chime in on Twitter, but I saw that thread and I was really <laughs> interested in what you said about blah, 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 because I had the same question. What I realized actually <clears throat> is that um, often the people I'm arguing with are not my target audience. I don't care if I convince them or not. They're, they're, they're people who are generating questions that if I think they, they are valuable questions that are worth answering to try and uh, refine my ability to raise myself to those challenges, that creates a space for me to work, to develop, to refine my communication of the ideas, to try and nail it down. And my audience for that are the people on the sidelines who are watching, who might not be not might not be chipping in, and they're not the grown-ups necessarily, but they're the next ones. Mm -hmm. And Tyler, I think 
you know, I bet you part of getting interested and in noticing in the younger players, <clears throat> one of the nice things about working with younger players and all those kinds of things is <clears throat> get them early, right? <laughs> get them early and you shape them from that point. But also like, but, but, I, but I mean that in not an evil way. Right. I mean that in a really deep kind of way. <clears throat> so what I've realized is that, you know, when I'm trying to communicate, there are, th th there are certain people who I'll just be cranky with because they deserve to be being uh, like there, are, there. There were some bullies on that Twitter thread and I was not having it. And I, you know, I, I was I was unimpressed with the professionalism of several people who engaged in that thread. So I did not I, I don't have time for that. No, I'm, that gets switched off and I will just push back on that and take the hit of being cranky. I don't care. But also. And and some of the some of the you're being cranky or too pushy, some of that is in bad faith as well. Some of it's this tone policing. It's in bad faith. It's trying to say, well, you can't say that. I don't know how to answer it, so I'm going to criticize the way you said it. And then there's the genuine pushback of like, actually, no, I was a bit of a dick, and I'm really sorry about that. It's a hard line to tell the difference. Um, but I think all of those things. One of the, I believe all of those things are legitimate responses. And it's about finding and matching up to the right ones and responding appropriately to the right ones. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, but, but again, it's like, why are we feisty? Why are we pushy? Because we care, mm -hmm. right? Because we think there's real promise for this approach to do the things that we think are excellent ideas, be it academically, theoretically, in terms of player welfare, in terms of player retention as kids, all those kinds of things. That's the other thing is that none of us are, none of us are doing this just to do it. We're doing it because it's serving the values that we have, right? We're doing it this way because this way aligns with the values we have for the things that we care about in our practice or of whatever that is. Um, and like, I think that's, I think that's pretty important to remember actually. And I would like more people to remember that. Yeah, va absolutely. Values are just, yeah, I'm big on values at the moment for lots of reasons, but yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, like, yes, it can be tough. And I, I, I personally work very hard to, to reflect on my communication. Um, but if I've been cranky with you and not said sorry, then it's because I thought there was a good reason for it. Um, and so maybe you should reflect on some of your stuff that you were saying. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's really good points. Marianne, I wanted to turn to you because I think some of this resonates. I know you're involved in coach education and I know like you talk about kind of the rebellious side of this and lessons, I know lessons from the naughty chair, I think is one of your <laughs> taglines for your coach. So kind of this, this feisty. Day. So what are your thoughts on kind of get, getting these messages across? Um. Yeah, I, I, fascinating um, listening to to what you guys have just been saying and particularly there Andrew actually um and that lines up really nicely Rob <laughs> <laughs> so I think yeah beautifully done I think what is so important whatever side you sit on that you just keep exploring the edges of that or where it doesn't fit or where a voice is slightly different um that we challenge ourselves as well um and I also think I I do you know the the people who are maybe sit in the more of an it depends or an IP thing, I am I am very very happy to work, you know to believe that they believe in what they're doing as well. Um, however, um, what I'm not happy with is shutting down a space for exploring on either side. That when somebody steps into a space and is bullying, and I use that word deliberately, it feels very very much that they you know, comments that are individual, that are specific to people, that are designed to, to press buttons, to hurt. They're not, they're not talking in a way that is about perspectives and about creating dialogue and discourse. When people shut down spaces like that and talk about, you know, oh, we don't want coaches infected with these eco warriors or whatever they think mm -hmm. they are, it, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, I think that's really damaging. I think that's incredibly damaging. And it's really important, whatever perspective you take to listen to those you know I guess it's what Dave Snowden would call the weak signals what are the voices on the periphery that are, that are different mm -hmm. they're saying something different and how you know may, maybe they don't make you know maybe it's not an important but it might just be that they're picking up on stuff that we're not 
it might just be that they allow us to reflect on you know the way in which we think about things I just think it's really healthy I would hate for somebody to think that I had to die before something changed <laughs> <laughs> powerful <laughs> that you can't change until retirement counts too <laughs> yeah. and the, the being sitting from an ecological perspective i hope that one of the ways we can walk our talk is that we do remain um open to you know what's happening, and to our eco, into our wider ecosystem, and to understanding the patterns and the way it works, and to being, you know, to having humility in in our place in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a, as a coach on the floor, Marianne, on a daily basis, I think keeping it social, as people say, is is pretty pivotal to keeping people connected and curious. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as I commented in the Dave Snowden session the other day, I think we need to remember why we're there in terms of we seem to forget that we're, we're, in, we're in a caring profession mm -hmm. um, when, when we enter these debates sometimes and it gets real loose. One of the ones, like with, particularly with a coach, couple of coach developers on the call and to piggyback um, Andrew's point of target audience. So I've had an interesting case study this week on myself. So in seven years ago, I graduated a coaching course and I got given a book allowance. And I asked did some trusted colleagues um, to recommend me some books. And I ordered those books. And I moved house a year after. And last week, I opened a box because I remembered I'd ordered some <laughs> books. And um, in, in that box, interestingly, was Skill Acquisition by Bob Shaw, um, uh, a quiet eye book by Vickers, um, Neuroscience for Coaches. <laughs> and I, just, I was just intrigued by this sense of meeting people where they're at. You know, and, and whether people had a foresight on my future that I didn't have at the time, um, because I've not been curious to open that box. I knew it existed. And now I'm curious now to open it. They're probably some of the books that I might go on Amazon and purchase. And I wonder from, they weren't coach developers who, who steered me towards those books, but I wonder in terms of, I guess, developing, co-creating understanding of pedagogy and things like this in this space, like, you know, what would what would have engaged me sooner or did I need to take my natural course to be curious on my own and make those mistakes to get to a point or perceived mistakes in my, my view of the world to get to where I am now. I wonder what people's take on that. That was. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say really quickly, that's probably what I mean when I talk about the keystone constraints and environments, what are the constraints that allow that environment to flourish? And it might just be that we safe space or it's, autonomy supportive mm. or other things and I don't know it's a nice one to explore <laughs> I think a lot about how I got into this and how I also think about sort of fortune favors the prepared mind right I think about that one a lot <clears throat> so I went to Indiana University to do my PhD and I was going to work with Linda Smith in her developmental lab because I had gotten interested in dynamical systems and she was one of the key names that was coming up a lot and I'd read a lot of her stuff. Um, and I was interested in figuring out kind of where cognition comes from. And I figure that if you're going to do that and do sort of AI kind of stuff, right, you don't program it from the beginning, right? What do you do? You, you, you program a baby and train it. So I was interested in developmental questions and so I was working with Linda. Then I met Jeff Bingham and I was his TA for a history and systems course. And he, Jeff teaches the history and systems of psychology as beginning with the Greeks and peaking at Gibson, which I just <laughs> is ad just adorable, right? It's a wonderful course. But anyway, we got chatting. And then we got chatting. And then I was his TA for his undergraduate perception action class. And then we also did some independent study where he was teaching me some dynamical systems stuff. And then I just said, can I officially switch into your lab, which apparently is a weird thing to ask in America. But everybody said, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll let you do it. That's okay. So there was an element of, but the, the, the thing that caught my attention was not just that Jeff's a lovely human being and who's really smart, but also he was talking about things that were interesting to me, but he was talking about them in a way I'd never heard before. But he was talking about them in a way that was like, oh, that kind of is interesting. So I was primed to kind of be thinking about these topics and I thought I had framed it. I thought I had identified how I wanted to go about actually, like the, the context in which I wanted to investigate these core issues. Um, 
but I happened to, to be in a position, you know, this is one of the things I loved about being at Indiana University. I was in a place where, like, that intellectual environment is so critical to my life. Why? Because it put me in a place where I knew what I kind of wanted to do, but I didn't yet know exactly how I was going to put it together. And I had the opportunity to meet somebody. So, yeah, there the, the really is... <clears throat> There is a there is a fortune favors the prepared mind issue thing here, you, you, and 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 it's the trick for me if you want to try and do it on purpose. And I I think this is easier said than done, but the trick is it's not about the specifically the context or the experimental task or the model that you're using to study things, right? So I did my PhD on coordinated rhythmic movement, and I still study finger wiggling, and it's yeah you know, I don't care about coordinated rhythmic movement. I'm using it to do other things. That's not the issue, right? The thing I'm actually interested in is where behavior comes from, right? And it just turns out that this is the experimental domain where I can learn some of these things. And because I knew that I was actually interested in those particular details rather than in the bigger picture, sorry, rather than the specific details of I want to study coordinated rhythmic movement, um, I was just kind of, I, I was generally receptive to noticing when somebody was talking about those things, even though I didn't recognize the context in which they were talking about them. Um, and so, yeah, like just... You know, I've always been a nerdy guy. And I'm, so, like, I'm always just, I've always had that kind of questioning and think, trying, you know, sort of thinking about these issues one step down from methods and more into kind of the principles and the theories and stuff. But I, it's, I could have succeed, I could have ended up being doing very well studying a whole bunch of different things besides coordinated rhythmic movement as my PhD topic, right? Or working with different people besides Jeff and the ecological approach. There's plenty of them. Right, I could have done just fine because I was interested in the key theory, theoretical issues. I just happened to be in a place and in a mindset that allowed these things. So, yeah, I was just, sorry, that was just what I was thinking about while you were talking about was how I kind of lucked into a little bit. That was the fortune that kind of suited me. But it also took a little bit of me being prepared in a certain way and thinking in a certain way. Yeah, I think that, that, that point, Andrew, and, and to pick up, um, again, I'm not, not sure who uh, who said it. it might have been uh, used to about values. Um, I think the, the the thing that's most attractive um, from from an ecological approach for me, uh, it, the two things that it, that it supports is that it supports humility, um, and, and we, which is a, a key value of, of how I try to take up with the world, and, and it supports this other, which is I think, which is inquiry, um, and, and and I think those those two things are how I shape my my. Um, my worldview with it, with regards to science. So when we write papers, I, I like to write uh, papers which just explore ideas. So Andrew, you you, you speak about uh, in, in your blog about you know thinking aloud in these theories and, until we've got some good ones. Um, I, I, I view writing uh, papers in a very similar lens um, in in terms of using it as a way to, to drive genuine inquisition and both humility and inquisition. I think circle back. To, to the notion very simplistically, which which for me an ecological approach absolutely um, uh, uh, supports, and, and I'll, I'll say why in a sec, the fact that I don't know the answers. I don't know the, all the answers and I don't want to feel like I know all the answers. I don't want to feel like a gatekeeper of knowledge. I, I don't want to feel like someone that, you know, uh, is, is um, uh, directing how to do things and where to go and find things and, I just think that's a really boring way of doing science, you know. Like, who, 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 um, who would like to read a paper that's cl that claims to have all the ideas? And as far as I'm aware, I've read a lot of research over the years. No paper in that particular worldview has ever claimed to have all the ideas. Um, and I, I say this to Tyler quite a bit. I like to view these things as lines of inquiry, which we can pick up and we can follow. I don't really know what's around the corner, but let's go and have a look together. Um, let, let's go and explore that particular landscape together. And to me, an ecological approach supports that. It supports that because it, 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 it's a worldview that um, is, is based for me on, on engagement and interaction. It views a scale of analysis, not at an organism. It views it as that enmeshment between its organism and the environment. And because it views its scale of analysis in that relational or transactional way, it's because it's a transactional meta theory from, from that perspective, the organism can't have all the answers. So we can't just keep looking at the organism and, and then inadvertently keep looking at their brain as, as having all, all, all the answers. It's, it's a really, um, uh, I think, 
two things about it. It's a really arrogant way of, of viewing the world that it's ready made for us. You know, well, it's not. Let's go out and explore it. We're an organism that, that is surrounded by an environment. We are part of it. We're not on top of it. We, I think I wrote in a paper once, we, we find our way through an environment, not across an environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, that that's, uh, a, a, I think, a, an integral part which gets lost. It, it gets lost in translation. And um it's why, for me, a, a really internalised approach to science was really boring, um, and, and it didn't serve that that level of inquiry that that, that I wanted to keep exploring into. Um, and from from that perspective, it's why I think um, you know we, we talk a bit about how we 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 come about in an ecological approach. It's, I, I like it's it, it's just something I progressively stumble into over time. Um, and, and more things, more veils of the environment get up, get lifted and I go and explore that a little bit more and uh, know something about that. I, I think that's pretty cool. Follow that thread and off we go again. Um, it, it's not about trying to fit data to a, a particular um, model that, of, of this is how it works. No, I view it much more as a, as a, as a it, I talk about it more as like a, a transdisciplinary enmeshment of, of, of threads. We just keep going and finding different threads. We follow that. Um, we, that's an interesting area. That's not as interesting. Okay, that that yielded something. Let's go and look at that way. Oh, that's cool. Let's go and look at that. So it's just this continuation, this 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 continued mission. And I think for practitioners, that's really uh, that, that adopt these like um, hierarchical worldviews. That's like not on. I remember having a chat when I when I was a practitioner, a full time practitioner. Uh, I remember having a chat to a board, uh, the, the board of the, the, the organisation, and we're like, all right, what's our model? What's our way? You know, like, what, what, are, what are we doing? And, and I, I kind of stumbled on that for a long time and, and I kind of whittled it back to this notion that we want to know answers to things. Like, we need, you know, really strong cause and effects so we can test it against that. We can test something against that. Um, and and I, I think that's what people battle a little bit within an ecological approach is that it's not a... Again, going back to that point earlier, it's not a methodology, right? It's not this level. It's a it's a value based, a principled approach on, on on our worldviews. So to whittle it down into a game model doesn't work. Mm. <laughs> like you, you can't you can't scribble it out and this is ecological dynamics in how we play football. Like what? Like it, that's that's not how it works. It's it's not how you how you do things. So it's a more principled approach to how we go about it. So then to try to whittle it down into into a definable model that we can then go about setting a training activity towards or training drills towards just don't work. Um, and, and inadvertently, that's the same approach that I take towards my science is that, uh, you know, I'm not working towards a, 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 a rigid model of how to do something. I'm more following genuine lines of inquiry that are shaped upon these principles um, that, that reside within an ecological approach. Yeah. No, I think so that's a – sorry, go ahead, Andrew. I just wanted to jump in on that. Someone asked on Twitter a couple of weeks ago um, about whether or not if you're an ecological psychologist, like, does it affect anything else that you do? And I thought about that and I was like, no, nah, like my entire worldview is oriented this way. In part, it always was. And what ecological psychology gave me was a vocabulary to explain why I think certain things. But it also really has strongly affected me in a lot of things, like in the way I interact with my kids and the way I, you know, like... One of my favorite things about my children is that they will say, I'm bored. And I'll go, oh, that's a shame. But I won't solve their problem. 30 seg- and the, But the thing I'm proud of is that after years of sort of working on this and trying to find the right constraints to help them through it, they'll within 30 seconds, they're off playing their own games and will immerse themselves in something for hours. Just And it all started with the sentence, I'm bored and I didn't do anything except just go, oh, that's a shame. What about, I don't know, you're interested in this kind of thing sort of vaguely constrain them based on what's going on but it, you know like that's just how i'm ba- like but like that's how i think about all my things that's how i do my science it's how i interact with my kids that's how i interact with my students it's how i do everything and again it gets back to this idea of values um and again you know the eco i genuinely believe the ecological approach is a very radical notion of what behavior where, where behavior comes from and what it does is i think it it, it does it shifts that focus so behavior is a, is about who you are in context, right? And all of those things come into play. And yeah, like it, it and again, it just connects up with that issue of values. And I think I find that 
I find that people who do the ecological stuff and really kind of have done it for a long time tend to be a certain kind of person and they tend to be the kind of people I get on with, right? It's why I like the little ecological conferences like eWeb and stuff because it's it's just a bunch of human beings I really like. And I've just, I've been very interested in that take for a long time. And so I agree entirely, Carl. I think it is just, yeah, that's it. it's because it's operating at that deeper, more sort of ontological level. We, th we think that we are certain kinds of, organisms that do things in certain kinds of ways for certain kinds of reasons and that has knock-on effects all the way through and i just I, I yeah no i think about that a lot and i think it's really important and again it gets it speaks to that point of why do, why do we get so feisty on twitter when somebody's cranky about it yeah, yeah. this this relates that, to that, that's exactly right. sorry that, that, that's exactly why i don't think you can attack it like you, you can't go like um the, the arguments to me are, are nonsensical because they're they're they're, they're trying they're mm. slicing it here you know, like that's and, and really the the discussion is it should be here. The discussion should how be how we 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 and really for me it whittles down to how we structure knowledge, right? Um, and 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 I don't I don't view this lens that we structure knowledge in representations that are inscribed in our minds, stored somewhere, and then enacted in in some representation. And Rob, you're 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 um, contrasting um, a, I don't know what public lecture that you provided. <laughs> on. Brilliant synopsis for that is that you, you, the reason you can't the public uh, service announcement <laughs> the reason it's not compat compatible uh, compatible um, is because they're 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 from roots of different trees, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like that that that's that that's the that's the reason it is. And exactly your point, Andrew, as well. I'll, I'll, I'll jump off my my my, uh, my ranting a little bit, but the the um, thing that really grinds me as well is that this isn't. Right, we have to stop thinking about it as like a sports science way of doing. It's like it's not, you know. Like we're applied sports scientists that, and and I got this this um, you know, one of them, one of the the, the sports scientists uh, I I respect, and I'm sure we all do. M near, at, at most the highest level you could generate is is, is Keith Davids, right? And 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 um, he, he's he's I had this conversation with him a while back about this notion that you know. We're just applied sports scientists that, that are interested in these ideas that then try to bring them to life in sport. They don't they, they don't originate. They don't. It's not it's not off limits. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it in those 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 sense, an ecological approach isn't just this like okay, I'm a coach on Tuesday and on my, with my athletes on Tuesday afternoon. All right, so okay, I'm an ecological person on Tuesday afternoons, <laughs> you know. But on Wednesdays, nah, like I'm just. I'm not coaching on Wednesday, so I'm, you know, not using ecological an ecological approach to how I uh, view my 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 kind of how I take up with the world, and that's just it's just wrong. It's it's not right to think um, that that a, an ecological um, a, approach is just a, a set of methodological tools that sports scientists use. It's a it's an entire worldview of how we take up everything we do, whether that be you know. Uh, how you 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 um, find your way to go and get a coffee in the morning, whether that be uh, how Andrew you you you, um, uh, you you interact with your children. Stu, on your podcast earlier this year, I, I spoke about a coach that, that came to me and said, "Geez, you know, once I started really enmeshing myself in a, in an ecological approach, I started stopping telling my children not to do these things mm -hmm. and started engaging with them as to why perhaps you might want to pick up a sharp knife, not just don't go into the second drawer." You know, like it, 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 it changes how you take up with everything you do, um, which, uh, which, which for me is, is, is like, again, super exciting. Like it's not, it's not just a, a scientific method that we, we then try to fit data to all the time, which is another argument altogether, which, which is grinds my gears um, mm -hmm. with, with an information processing approach is that it's like really hardcore quantitative. Yeah. Um, that Data and analytics is the only way forward. And, and I think that's that's. It, it, yes. like, it anyway. pains me that I have to get off a little early because this is obviously mm -hmm. going a lot of places that I love. But just this, I'll just add real quick before I hop off the sheer vibrancy and the way that I now view the entire world and just phenomena in the world has just fundamentally changed. And, and it was something for me whenever I came on to an ecological approach a number of years ago. It just it changed the way I viewed the world, but it was how I was interacting with the world all the, all along. 
and just like finding my, like to your point, Carl, like finding your way as you go, like knowing as you go, that really brings about the notion of, you know, being attuned to something and, and being able to be inquisitive and the idea of searching and, you know, exploring and, you know, for us and for me personally, it's just been, um, you know, mind blowing. So I challenge those out there, the listeners out there that have really never thought about it that way. It's not just about sport. It's about everything. So Rob, as always, thank you. Everyone on the call. This is wonderful. Thanks, Cheers. Thanks for having me guys. <laughs> Great yeah. to see you again, Tyler. Yep. Likewise. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think those are good puts. I I always hesitant to use like a faith based analogy when talking about science, but it depends. Seems to me like I'm going to be a Christian on Tuesday, a Muslim on Wednesday, atheist on Thursday, just so I have all my bases covered. Right. <laughs> that that's what it seems like to me. <laughs> right. It it is right. It's those things are not compatible uh, with each other. Where. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I get to, when I get to sports heaven, it'll be fine. yeah. It'll be, it'll we'll see who fun. wins. Yeah, <laughs> I've um, I've often described it as a, a, a similar but not quite the same mm-hmm. analogy. That it's mm-hmm. like it's like saying, well, you know, if I'm building a garden shed, then the earth is flat. But if I'm going to send, uh, you know, if I'm going to send something into space, a satellite. <laughs> uh, then it actually matters whether it's flat or not. But when people use a, a certain um, problem or a certain environment as evidence for IP. I my head now goes. It's a garden shed. <laughs> it's a garden shed problem. Of course, it doesn't matter which one you use at that point because either would work. But it's not evidence. <laughs> that the that, that's actually one of the one yeah. of the issues. This is one of the issues, though. I do think that's important to discuss a little bit. And this goes back to something you were talking about earlier on, Rob, which is like you know, the paper that's been written talking about, you know certain people talking bullshit, this, that, and the other, and pointing fingers at, you know, bloggers and podcasters and people like that, um, you know, and, and definitely, you know, I'm, I'm in that bracket, right? <laughs> so the, the and, and the rationale used is, um, broadly speaking, I'll just do a very broad synopsis, which is, you know, basically these people, firstly, don't really know what they're talking about. Secondly, uh, they sound like they do, and they try and impress that, and they're all on the take because they're all trying to make money out of either doing conferences or, um, you know, charging for products or whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. And you shouldn't listen to them. Uh, coaches, you should, you should, you should listen to people who really know what they're talking about. People with really good, who are doing really good science and, and they're the people, and you should be much more critical about the sources that you use. And you should really start to think about, you know, thinking these things through and the rationale utilized in that. And, and this is partly, I think, a little bit of a systematic approach. I've seen this happening now, right? Uh, the ecological approach is being painted as fringe. It's being painted as a bunch of fringe crazies who are trying to infect the kind of traditional tried and tested worked for centuries a a, a way of doing coaching and and actually you can tell that they're fringe do you know why because they they say things with real certainty and they sound very very sure of themselves and they don't really know what they're talking about and it depends right and they can't say things that are certain like that because it depends Mm -hmm. what does it depend on well you have to speak to me another time or you have to use your pjdm so that's where we get that kind of pushback but the issue is fundamentally there's a i believe a systematic approach which is basically trying to say don't listen to them they're weirdos listen to us we've got the science on our we've got a science behind us and we're we're strong and we know where we're coming from and there's a there's a problem with this really which is um and an an interesting thing about like the uh, going through this experience and back and forth and all that sort of stuff is is the one sort of positive is is it causes reflection and it causes sometimes me to kind of consider things and to look for things and I might look for those things in places that I perhaps otherwise wouldn't have and and I ended up listening to um you know one of the I guess the like interlocutors uh, on Twitter a guy called Derek O'Riordan who's kind of my counterpart in Scotland doing a very similar job and we've had some really good conversations off the back of it some kind of honest reflections and ironically we come from the same place the interesting thing about uh, he's got a podcast that he's started and it's uh, called a coaching discourse podcast it's quite interesting and he had a couple of people on there who took a couple of shots at um uh colleagues of yours andrew um, who took a couple of shots at uh, the ecological approach a little bit a little bit unfair but anyway you know that is what it is but in the process um andrew abraham who again i've had a couple of sort of back and forth with on things like this was talking about um 
uh, you know, kind of different approaches to sort of learning and knowledge um, with, with students and using a, a Perry's approach around this idea of starting out with kind of dualism where you think everything's right and wrong, uh, moving into, you know, kind of, um, you know, a multiplicity, nothing's right and wrong, everything's pof- got validity, then something relative, it's contextual. And actually, you know, that's, I think, where some of the it depends comes from. It's a kind of a relative relativist perspective saying it's all about your context and your situation. And actually, you need to be able to respond to context and situation. And that's why they make the argument for it depends. You don't know my context. How can you possibly say that your ecological approach is the best way and the only way and this, that, and the other? And the articulation isn't, it's not the way. It's not a way. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of proposing, a, it's proposing a, a, a consideration. And it's a starting point from which you can begin to engage and you can consider methods and you can come up. And sometimes the methods don't exist. It's like having a tool that doesn't, a technology that doesn't exist. You have to design it with the individual then and there. So there's lots of that happening and all these sorts of things. And, it, and, it, and so there's this, so this relativism idea and then the idea of a committed relativist, right, you know. Um, which is, I think, where a lot of people who sort of espouse this idea of eclecticism comes from, which is I'm actually committed to a, I'm actually, it's based on my context. I'm going to pick and choose from a range of different things, and I'm going to use context to put color. Now, I hadn't heard of this idea before, and I was thinking about it quite a bit. And the one thing that I thought was really interesting was, is that, that you know, th- they argue that we're being a little bit too sur- sure of ourselves and presenting a bit of a kind of black and white dualistic notion, we're right, you're wrong. But actually, it's not. It's not that, is it? It's really just saying, look, We've got a commitment to something. I'm not sure we're com- we're com- with committed relativism necessarily. But there's a commitment to something, right? There's a commitment to a way of looking at things, which then fosters a way of exploring. So I genuinely think there's like there's something there around this idea of a, of, commi- of being committed to something. But then I noticed that the notion of dualism is the idea that you ask the students to um, look upwards towards more knowledgeable individuals who will give you your source of knowledge. And I thought about that paper. And I thought, that's exactly what the message is. You coaches don't know what you know. You don't know anything. You don't know anything. The only people you can trust is us. So we'll give you the information that you need. And you've got that source of, you've got that source of truth. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a pretty scary message, out, isn't it? To say to all the coaches out there, you don't know anything, really. You've got to trust, trust, trust only the good sources. And there was even a follow-up statement that said, we're not, we're not saying anything about uh, we're not having to go at all bloggers and podcasters. We're just having to go at the bad ones. Well, well which ones are the bad ones <laughs> in, who, in whose eyes? And then we're not having to go at all research, just bad research. Again, which is the bad research? Who decides that? Yeah. So there's a big issue there for me. And I think there's yeah. something that people should understand about, you know, I think there's almost, to me, there's like there's a paper there that kind of doesn't pass its own bullshit test. Yeah. And, and actually that's a big concern for me because the problem is, is people are listening to it. Really, really intelligent people are listening to this. It's a little bit. It's a little bit like, in my opinion, it's a little bit like a kind of uh, an information war in lots of respects. It's saying, no, 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 no. This is the way to think. And and this, there is an articulation. It's, those people are a bit, bit mad over there. Don't listen to them. And I'm seeing it actually in some sports who were exploring this, and they were actually having some really, really interesting things happen within their sport. You know, and and they've just turned the corner. They've turned back. Oh no, it's getting a bit scary. It's getting a bit difficult. We haven't necessarily got all the answers to our questions. We're going to turn back. Yeah. And it's concerning me. Yeah. A couple of points, Stu, a thing that bothers me too is at the same time it's being pushed as fringe and extreme, p- p- the people that are doing that are seeing that it's resonating with a lot of coaches. So they're pulling these ideas. Oh, our, our thing can have a CLA. <laughs> we can. <laughs> well, so they're pulling ecological dynamics fits in there. Um, the other thing I would say about the general, it depends – Human beings are horrible with unlimited choice, right? We're horrible at it. Think of standing in front of your microwave. How many buttons do people use, right? So giving people unlimited options in a, is a bad idea, right? We need constraints, right? When, yeah. when I first moved to the States yeah. and I discovered what constitutes a cereal aisle in America <laughs> versus New Zealand, I nearly died. <laughs> yeah, so... Anyone else? Marianne, do you want to? Um, yeah, sorry, I'm I'm busy typing. I'm just <laughs> the other thing that I was the other thing that um, I I'm sort of noticing, and I'm not sure if it's a pattern or it's again, it's really difficult, isn't it, to know just what I'm attuned to and what's actually out there, and and you know, and how much that overlaps with other people's perceptions. Um, I I was reading a paper um, 
I can't remember who it was. And it was actually looking at some of this stuff within um, martial arts and what's well, training for for self defense for police officers actually authentic i'm going to not not name any names but it was really interesting to me because it started off talking about well humans are complex adaptive systems this is a complex environment it's all non linear and then it kind of got to the point where it went so if we use professional judgment decision making and the more we know the more we <laughs> constrain <laughs> <laughs> i just like i don't understand <laughs> It's like bits of the stuff that is resonating or that, you know, again, you know, I talk to or you you play with kids or even my dog or my horses. It works for them. You kind of go, it's just a natural way of being until we get educated out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, or we move from that explorer to exploit adulthood, stop playing type thing. And it's really interesting for me that there seems to be this appropriation of bits of, of um, a more ecological understanding or way of viewing the world into into all these other things that then kind of push back against the principles of it so i'm gonna i'm gonna put on my best jeff bingham voice and say there's a history here <laughs> so that's exactly what's happening in the in the academic field right um in the oh god when was the tucker and alice paper about affordances and using pictures of things and it, it was like mid 90s right? yeah Cognitive psychology has spent a lot of time trying to co-opt affordances and make them a thing that they can study with pictures of objects, for example. And there's been the, the, and it's been hilarious that like the whole field is dominated by a back and forth between, oh, it looks like an affordance effect. Oh, it looks like a Simon effect, like just a, uh, a response, uh, uh, stimulus response compatibility effect. And that's the source of the argument. And there's just like, well, you know, Tucker and Alice put out this paper and Diane Pitch's group is doing this. And then they just they just yell at each other. And that's just been going. But but it's a concerted effort by cognitive psychology to take on what they clearly see as an interesting idea that's getting traction with people. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to turn it into something that they can use. And so it happens again. Like, so what look, one of the things I've really noticed in this conversation from as all the uh, people who operate as actual coaches are talking is the the nature of your problems and the nature of the things that are happening to you and that you're thinking about are a hundred percent also happening in the academic field it's not like we're off in our ivory towers doing a wonderful thing. it's all the same all the same questions are coming up in terms of co-opting this or the politics of this and that or the um yeah everything we everything you guys have talked about tonight i'm sitting there going yes that's also happening in my neck of the woods. And, and that I found really interesting. So it's, I, I just yeah. kind of wanted to, to just to make that connection because it's, I think it's another really important thing that's come out of this conversation for me anyway. Yeah. No, I'd echo that, Andrew. Uh, I think I shared with people that the, there's a quote in a um, article by Richard Schmidt talking about his, his frustration with the back and forth. And it, it was in the 20 years ago. It basically is exactly what's happening now, but we got maybe 10 minutes left to wrap up. We've been going. Oh, thank you guys for staying so long. I guess what I wanted to ask now is where going from here. Um, so if you're a coach or a practitioner or even a student that's listening to all this debate and stuff, um, what do we, what message do we want to send people about? What do we, what do we want them to do from here? Craig, maybe you like you as a coach, you know, if you were, you've, you're in it, <laughs> you've gone through it yourself. W what would you kind of advise people that are maybe kind of intrigued by this or they're confused by this? What do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I do. Thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, I think build connections would be a key one. Um, I think my journey has been like a very emergent one, but it's, it's grown once the connections start to shape and, and, and they can be on either side. You know, I, I've, I've, I've sat in PJDM workshops as well as more ecological approach chatting to Andrew in the same week. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the key thing, and I think you do this really well, Rob, from, from a coach's point of view who isn't a scientist but is beginning to be intrigued and kind of feeling like I have a responsibility to, to connect the two somewhere, is, is relating it to practice and context that we can understand. Because the language can be very, very difficult. You know, I consider myself to be vaguely intelligent, but it's hard to grasp. And, you know, some papers I'm there, if, if I'm on Wikipedia too many times, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to break the flow. 
So I think when you when you bring the language into real life examples, and I'd like to see us explore the space personally, I think it'd be helpful for me is is where we evaluate. And I think you began to do that, Rob, in your public service <laughs> announcements, where we begin to look at a problem and then we we discuss different ways of viewing or 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 acting around the problem with people. Um, and bringing in a, an athlete or player view as well into that would be really useful. I know, like I've vicariously learned learned about baseball in the last two years, Rob, <laughs> and and then subsequently been able to take that away, discuss with colleagues, make sense of it, discuss with athletes, and and muck around with it effectively in canoe slalom. So it is really useful when we bring it into context. And I think the more we do that, and the more connections that Rob makes to Andrew and to other practitioners is really useful for me on the ground in, in the coaching world. Yeah. No, I think that that is great advice. Carl, your, your kind of thoughts on this, using your, one of your, your term from your, one of your recent papers, way for how, how is wayfinding in this kind of noise of this, all this kind of debate? What, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, it, it, it's funny. Like, um, I wasn't going to talk talk that, but you've kind of led me into that area. So, like, <laughs> one of the one of the integral parts with with being able to find your way um, mm-hmm. uh, is actually having really rich, um, really diverse environments, and 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 it's that richness that helps you support your your kind of behaviour as as you go. So, really flat, bland environments. Um, you know, these these opaque, nothing's there. You can't find your way, right? And in those particular environments, you, you tend to rely upon some form of augmented augmented information to help you uh, navigate your way. So, firstly, I actually think um, uh, clearly from a from a, a scientific perspective, debates are great, right? I, I, I think they're a brilliant forum. I think they're brilliant things. I would love to see a separate rant. A separate rant is, is that I, I'd actually love to see um, uh, sports science promote more. Um, uh, commentaries and, and response to edit uh, response letters and, and these types of approaches because it actually I, I think helps us go forward uh, right as opposed to just you know I'll continue to work here and you continue to work I'd, I'd like to see sports science as a, as, as a fairly young field anyway adopt more uh, adopt more critiques and, and I wonder if an outcome of, of, a, of a forum like this is that we could uh, could could you know push more position statements and, and encourage commentary back to them um, but that, that, that's a separate narrative. I, I think um, I think there's 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 uh, two two parts. I, I think one is is there is an absolute onus on on, on a scientific perspective that we have to make uh, strong efforts in in papers if we want them to be used if we want these ideas to be used by coaches um, uh, or at least be accessible to coaches, we have to make a strong effort to make them interpretable for them, whether that be exactly like what Craig was saying, mm-hmm. whether that be in the presentation of examples, whether that be in in, in the language that we use um, in, in how we write papers, uh, but we have to make these ideas really, really accessible uh, for them. Uh, and that, that, that's an area that, that a lot of us uh, in a broad group are really trying to work towards, whether that's scientifically in, in papers or Rob in, in, in forums and Stu in forums like you guys are, are putting putting together. Um, uh, the, the other thing, I, I guess, the, the last little bit of advice is, is I just always push back against um, definitives and certainties. Um, that, that I, I don't think the world is definitive or, or, or certain. Um, and so, again, I've said it a bit, but, but people claiming to, to have the knowledge that can then be imparted in you, I just like, I push back against. That's, that's read this textbook or read this paper and you'll know all the, the answers. It's like, no way. Like, it, it, again, going back to Craig's point, connections are about opening new lines of inquiry that you then go and follow and 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 and, and explore yourself. We talk about it as self discovery, but it should be more like active self discovery. It's a process that we do together. Um, and I just find these things by myself. I way find solo, so to speak. But it's being guided in a in a richly um, a, a, a constructed in, environment. Oh, constructed is the wrong word, but a, a richly um, a, a grown environment, I, I think. But, yeah, it's something I always I, I put to, to my PhD students is be cautious of definitives because nothing is definitive. And that doesn't mean it depends. And, uh, Andrew, you brought that up <laughs> on, on one of your, your tweets. That doesn't mean it depends. It just means that no one should claim to have the answers to everything. Um, that, that, that's not how science or practising practitioner ring works uh, that's not how, how 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 it operates yeah 
Oh, that's good. Marianne, what are your thoughts on moving this forward and kind of po- positive moves here? <laughs> positive moves forward. Yeah. yeah, I think for me, one of the most important things is for for us to model a safe space. I, hopefully that makes sense to you that we, um, you know, in the way we interact and what we do, we create somewhere that people can come and connect to and explore and be part of a conversation and with whatever, you know, wherever they are thinking, however they are thinking and whatever they're exploring so that we really make sure that we model a space that's, um, that's, that is that nurturing garden as it were for somebody to wayfind from. I think it's important to, for, for me that, um, there's a recognition that there are different perspectives and to support people in understanding that the differences between them in a way that's not too, that's not confusing and doesn't feel, um, again, unsafe or judgmental. Um, and I, and I agree with those points about, you know, looking at the way we write things, making it more, um, practical giving um examples i'm certainly thinking about the paper that i'm writing can i do a like a blog style article that you know summarizes it can i do short podcasts can we as researchers and practitioners think a little bit more about how we um engage in um you know communicating what we're doing and how we're thinking and what we're exploring um you know, I've done that. I tried to do that in the, the sort of blog post I started off with and trying to, you know, even things like using things like a, an ugly curve or the snow rabbits and poo sticks. And those concepts are just ways to try and help people um, get access into something that hopefully allowed them to think about it differently without it just being dressed up in too much complex language. Um, and and I guess I guess the big thing at the moment when I talk to people, certainly within coach development, they they. They feel that there's a pathway already in this direction with people telling them there's loads of evidence that we've discussed this. All the science says this is the way that works. This is right. This is all a bit woo-woo over on this other side. And then, but they look to the other side and they go, oh, that seems really fascinating. But then there's kind of, they can't find a handrail into it. And and I think there's um, maybe whether that's a reality or a perception that for you know young coach and coach developers where do they start how do they set off wayfinding where can we give some points for them to explore um rather than them feel that there's a big scary space that they might be being bullied in being in or there's somewhere that feels a bit safe and structured yeah yeah no that's really good and and mary and i'd point out that the bulk of the science doesn't show that the information um there's very little Sorry, I, yeah. yeah, no, I know that's a common belief. I know you weren't saying <laughs> um, so there's, it's a garden shed thing, isn't it? The yeah, of- yeah, no, there's very few studies that Rob, have compared. Sorry, sorry to jut in, Rob, but I think on Marianne's point, it's re- mm-hmm. really interesting in the sense of um, a safe stretch for people, for coaches. Like we would, we would practice that with athletes in that, you know, people's capacity to stretch mm-hmm. can, can become chaotic. And it's whether you're, you know, choosing to be there or going there by default where you can't cope is really important. So when meeting people where they are coaches and taking those small steps on the fringes, as it was phrased tonight, I think is really critical um, rather than going the whole, the whole hog straight from the off. I, I certainly, I know a colleague, for example, on Dave Snowden's session earlier in the week, who is a really quite esteemed coach and coach developer, just yet yeah, did not have the capacity five minutes in and WhatsApp me and was like, I'm out. And I think it was only, I was ready at that particular time, having been prepared with some pre-reading, as Andrew put it, to take it on board. But the 2018 me would not have been ready for that, and I'd have been off the call. Um, so it would have needed introducing in a, in a slightly softer manner, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Andrew. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Marianne, did you? Have- yeah, just really, really quickly. I think that's really important. And I one of the things I'm playing around with in concepts is that creating a safe space. So this is like, a, Craig, an eddy or, you know, um, an, an exit off a ridge or something or somewhere that you know you can go back to that feels safe so in the exploration the handrail is not necessarily going forward because you've got that wayfinding but it's easier to do if you feel that you have somewhere to retreat to and you are able to retreat if you need to mm-hmm. so you forward and explore and experiment because you can handrail back mm-hmm. out of it if you need to yeah. andrew what, what, what kind of your thoughts on moving forward Many things. So just to touch based on what Craig and Marianne were just saying, 
Um, whenever you talk about those kinds of things, I always think of uh, Vygotsky's phrase of zones of proximal development, right? And so Vygotsky was a surprisingly ecological kind of thinker in terms of the way he was going about thinking about education and learning. And I, I, I like this concept of a zone of proximal development in that you're, you're, you're here and there's, there is a range of places that you can get to from there, but there's also a range of places that are just out of reach. And that's and that's important, right? That's what I think about when I think about I'm not going to convince a bunch of senior cog sci, uh, you know, cognitive psychologists to suddenly be ecological. Why? Because it's kind of, it's outside their zone of proximal development. Not because they it's not because they're not smart enough. It's because of where they are and their life that they've lived and the work that they've done has put them in a place where the next step for them is not ecological engagement it's starting to engage with these things a little bit differently so yeah anyway i'm, I'm fascinated about that i think creating creating spaces for people to be able to engage with the material and, and 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 also us actively working to identify where people are at so that we can you know that's part of my job for example i think about that a lot when i'm teaching students right part of my job is to you know, teach my students to think like cognitive psychologists in various kinds of ways. But part of doing that successfully is about identifying where they're at and having those conversations. In terms of moving all this forward, so there's been, you know, lots of good ideas. I was thinking about academically, what's the way to kind of move this forward? What can we do? What can we do as researchers uh, to kind of help? And I think it's funny. One of the things, I have, as an academic, in, uh, interacted with practitioners in a bunch of different settings. So like occupational therapists when I was up in Aberdeen doing work with kids with DCD and sports coaches. And somehow the idea that we academics in our ivory tower are somehow like the source of the knowledge and we get the final say is a real thing. Like I was very caught off guard by the degree to which people were super defensive about me coming in because, you know, occupational therapy practice is actually just like coaching it's a bit of a goddamn mess why is it a bit of a goddamn mess because they what they're trying to do is they're trying to address the individual needs of a given child and that means being really kind of flexible with a bunch of stuff and one of the things i learned was that the the occupational therapists wanted to work with us on research projects and they wanted to help us out it was all part of the nhs's kind of general remit and general attitude it was all good but they were terrified of us coming into their clinic and telling them that they were doing it wrong because of science. And it was weird because it had literally never occurred to any of the scientists involved in the group that that's what we were going to do. We were coming in going, no, we want to have a conversation. We want to start that discourse. We want to find out what you want to know so that we can see if we can bring the tools into play. And there was, there was a, a long period of just miscommunication because of this. So, <clears throat> I thought it was a really valuable lesson. So I think there's a couple of things to go for it. I think we academics need to learn <clears throat> to how to communicate with practitioners better. And that means talking less and listening more and being reflective and 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 trying to trying to listen for those signs of the coach feeling like they're under the microscope. Right. But also what I would really like is the coaches to again, it's like like the vocabulary, meet us halfway, right? We'll come to you and we'll try and communicate things effectively and try and com communicate our intentions, but just know that we're actually not, we're actually not judging you, right, mm -hmm. coaches? Like, we're not, actually. Like, I know that thread on Twitter goes, got a bit judgy for various <laughs> reasons, but uh, fundamentally, we know that you're doing your job in good faith. That's it, right? You are, as a coach, in general, not a dick trying to hurt your athletes. <laughs> Okay, I'm happy to, for that to be a baseline. So to bring this forward, I think I think there's a bit of work to be done on both sides. I think I think we as we as academics need to we think differently about how things work to practitioners just because of the world we live in, and and practitioners think differently because of the worlds they live in. We need to recognize that as a as an ecosystem, as a members of an ecosystem, we all need to recognize that we're coming at this with slightly different angles. And we need, again, we just need to not give up on the first hurdle, right? Just if, it, if the communication doesn't work right away, just pay attention to the fact that the communication is not working and notice that, don't get pissed off. And there's like, I think there's a lot of tensions that crop up and get, 
And look, everyone's busy. Everybody's stressed. Why are those practitioners stressed? Because they've got deadlines and goals and pressures from the NHS and pressures about money and resources. And we're the same boat trying to get grants and do all the things, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of conversations to be had, but they're all conversations, right? Even when I throw something out on Twitter, actually, I'm, I don't intend that to be, here's my thought, here are the thoughts of Andrew Wilson. No, what I'm doing is I'm throwing a bunch of crap out there and seeing what sticks, kind of. And the only reason I know what sticks is where people push back. Uh, I learned a ton of useful stuff. So I think, right, to be concrete and just to kind of wrap it up because I know we've been going on for a while, the thing I think that I think we will, will help us go forwards is for all of us, academics and coaches, just to reach out a little bit towards each other as opposed to reflexively kicking back, which, and there was a lot of reflexive kicking back going on on Twitter over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was this, I think somebody mentioned, I think uh, Stuart or somebody was bringing up, I think that was a, I think that was the source of a lot of the, of the trouble. First things first, assume that we're all working in good faith until somebody shows you otherwise, mm -hmm. right? And because you know what? The people who are not working in good faith, they revealed themselves awful fast in that thread and it was fine, right? <laughs> but everybody else, engaging, we're engaging in good faith. Let's work on that. And, and, and that's certainly something that I need to work on as well because I get very cranky at people sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no good points. Stu? Uh, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, can I just say, I just it's been a really fascinating conversation and uh, a really valuable one, and a lot of great perspectives shared. Um, and and I, I take a lot from what everybody what everybody has said. I guess um, just a few, I guess, things that occurred to me. Um, and just just picking up on Carl's point about this idea of certainty, it's an interesting thing because that's one of the things I think that is is an accusation that's thrown is you know, you're trying to present it as the only way and and you've got to stop that because it's not the only way. It's not the panacea. And and it's a mistake. It's not being presented as the only way. <laughs> it's being presented as a way. Now, we're pretty, well, we're, we're pretty committed to the way, but that doesn't mean it's being presented as the only way. Um, now, and the bit I struggle with a little bit, and this is where the tr triggering tends to happen, is is that we've all articulated today that actually we're pretty strongly attached to this because not only do we feel an affinity to the kind of scientific underpinnings and the theoretical underpinnings, but it also maps on very, very um, heavily to how we see the world and what we value, you know, and, and the things that we value and the things that we prize. And I've, you know, one of the things I've realized, I suppose, is, is that some of the time, sometimes when I put something out there and I get, you know, quite a lot of negativity in response and, you know, and you say, you know, you can't say that, you can't say that. I respond to that by, because what they don't realize is, is they're saying you can't say that because you're just being too certain about yourself. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying, this is something that I'm, I'm really, really interested in and I really want to kind of share it with the rest of the world. And they say, you can't say it. And I'm like, what, well, you can't say something that's really important to my value set and is actually the way I see the world. Who, who the hell are you? How dare you? <laughs> and it doesn't go very well from there. <laughs> so obviously, that's not an easy starting point for a conversation. And I guess one of the things that I have to understand is if I'm placing something out there, there's bound to be some pushback on it. And I should expect some of that. And also, um, I don't have to respond to it all. You know, so we can just leave it there and let people ruminate with the idea, and 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 then Marianne and Craig's idea really around the kind of the safe space idea. Um, but I'm I guess the zone of proximal development concept you see is sometimes there is too much stretch. I'm creating too much stretch. It's just too big a provocation, and it's totally understandable, isn't it, for people to say and and particularly I think Andrew, your argument gets misconstrued a little bit, which when you say pick a side, you know, you can't kind of have your cake and eat it. You can't. You can't straddle two paths. Somebody puts me on Twitter. Why can't you just follow two paths? I said, well, you'll do the splits. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm saying that we're just saying, look, it's worth it. It's worth a go, isn't it? Have a, come over and explore a bit. But don't think you can explore while still holding on to the other stuff because it's just not going to work. But what we're not saying is you've got to come here forever. If you come and you genuinely don't like it, get back out. Come in the shallow end for a bit if you want. You don't have to jump straight in the deep end and think, "Oh God, I can't, I can't swim." Come in the but shallow least, end, play around. At least you'll know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
exactly. Yeah. And the, so the final thing I'll just say, Rob, just to quickly, just to sum this up a little bit, is um, uh, I, I just I just get slightly fearful as well that uh, the kind of opposite message. So what often it's a, res- a reflexive response to. You, there's a lot of people in our community, our world. I don't want to call it our community. I don't want to create it tribal. But there's a lot of people who are kind of mapped onto an ecological perspective who are putting content out there. I got a brilliant thing from Alex Lasku, Carl, right? Mm. Like, I mean, rock star, isn't she? Mm. And uh, she's put out on Twitter, look, I'm just doing my PhD thing. I've got a presentation. If anybody wants it, I'm saying, yes, please, Alex. She's emailed it to me. Mm. And there's a whole presentation that she's done. And the time it must have taken her to do it. But she's putting content out. And you think, that's just awesome, right? So there's a lot of people putting content out. And there's a lot of people going, rubbishing the content. Mm-hmm. And I'm and a bit, uh, but not necessarily are providing anything particularly strong alternatively. And and if there is people who have been taking, a, having a go and saying, oh, your podcast is biased and these sorts of things and saying, oh, you've only got one perspective, you're unbalanced, all these sorts of things, I, I absolutely take, his, I'll take that accusation on the chin. I am exploring one side of a world, right? I'm not going to, uh, there's, there's no, I'm not opening it up to the other side, but. I have actually now said, right, well, I'm definitely, okay, I will have a conversation. Show me where I'm going wrong. Show me where the misunderstanding is. And no one will come on. Mm. And what can you do then if you can't have a dialogue with somebody? You can't even explore where your misunderstandings are. And kudos to a couple of people who have, not necessarily publicly, but we've had private mm. conversations. And you do get a lot of better, much better understanding. And, it's, it's, and, and I just think I just would kind of, I've got nothing to gain by doing that. But I genuinely am happy if anybody says, I've got questions, I've got problems, I'm not sure, this, that, and the other, I will happily have a conversation with them. And I'll happily publish it. So you can't say fairer than that, can you? Yeah. No, I, I agree, Stuart. And I'll just quickly thank you, all of you, for staying <laughs> the marathon session. I'll just say a couple of things. You know, all I want out of this is people to accept that the ecological approach is a fundamentally different it's distinct. It's irreconcilable with information. You don't have to believe it or accept it. You know, I do, obviously, but I just want you to, it does not fit anywhere in it depends. If you believe in the it depends grid, it cannot fit in there. There's no room for it. If you, you can go off and believe it depends, but you can't do an ecological approach at the same time. It's not a box in there. <laughs> it's a completely distinct. Um, so that's that's the main thing I would say. Um, I, li- I really like the idea of creating the space. Um, you know, one thing I would say with coaches, you need to, in space, the way I th- was thinking of it is making a commitment if you want to try this. If you're going to do a five-minute set part of your practice with a small-sided game because you heard they were cool, it's not going to work right? You need to make a commitment to thinking about how to design the constraints or and maybe doing it for a series of practices, right? It's a totally different view. You don't have to jump in and completely change all your sessions, but you do have to make some bit of a commitment to it or it's not going to work and you'll be back to the... <laughs> so so I, w- I would make that point. So, so thank you everyone for that. Um, as mentioned a few times, the next one of these, I think it's next Tuesday, it's myself and Andrew and uh, Rajiv Raganathan and Nick Winkleman. We're going to talk, we're going to explore uh, verbal instructions from a few very different points. Um, yeah, another thread that was a long time ago of Andrews that started. So so Twitter is good for some things. It's starting these. But also the last thing I'll say, Echo Stewart is, well, I'm not afraid of, of engaging in, in Andrews, in, all of us in discussion and debating all this. It's, as long as it's in good faith mm-hmm. and professional, uh, you know, we treat people like professionals and uh, yeah. common courtesy. I'm happy to do that. Anyone want to come on, you know, you know, more than that, but a lot of that, that's kind of my requirements. <laughs> if we, you have to make some effort into understanding the material too, if we, you know, so, yeah. but anyway, so thank you everyone for hanging around <laughs> this long and we'll see, everybody. we'll see you next time. Okay. That's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.